Chapter 9 of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit, Michigan, June 2007. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, translated by George Long, Chapter 9. He who acts unjustly acts impiously. For since the universal nature has made rational animals for the sake of one another, to help one another according to their deserts, but in no way to injure one another, he who transgresses her will is clearly guilty of impiety towards the highest divinity. And he too who lies is guilty of impiety to the same divinity. For the universal nature is the nature of things that are, and things that are have a relation to all things that come into existence. And further, this universal nature is named truth, and is the prime cause of all things that are true. He then who lies intentionally is guilty of impiety inasmuch as he acts unjustly by deceiving. And he who also lies unintentionally inasmuch as he is at variance with the universal nature and inasmuch as he disturbs the order by fighting against the nature of the world for he fights against it who is moved of himself to that which is contrary to truth, for he had received powers from nature through the neglect of which he is not able now to distinguish falsehood from truth. And indeed he who pursues pleasure as good and avoids pain as evil is guilty of impiety. For of necessity such a man must often find fault with the universal nature, alleging that it assigns things to the bad and the good contrary to their deserts, because frequently the bad are in the enjoyment of pleasure, and possess the things which procure pleasure, but the good have pain for their share, and the things which cause pain. And further, he who is afraid of pain will sometimes also be afraid of some things which will happen in the world, and even this is impiety. And he who pursues pleasure will not abstain from injustice, and this is plainly impiety. Now with respect to the things toward which the universal nature is equally affected, for it would not have made both unless it was equally affected towards both, towards these they who wish to follow nature should be of the same mind with it and equally affected. With respect to pain then and pleasure, or death and life, or honor and dishonor, which the universal nature employs equally, Whoever is not equally affected is manifestly acting impiously. And I say that the universal nature employs them equally, instead of saying that they are, they happen alike to those who are produced in continuous series and to those who come after them by virtue of a certain original movement of providence, according to which it moved from a certain being to this ordering of things, having conceived certain principles of the things which were to be, and having determined powers productive of beings and of changes and of such like successions. It would be a man's happiest lot to depart from mankind without having had any taste of lying and hypocrisy and luxury and pride, However, to breathe out one's life when a man has had enough of these things is the next best voyage, as the saying is. Hast thou determined to abide with vice, and has not experience yet induced thee to fly from this pestilence? For the destruction of the understanding is a pestilence, much more indeed than any such corruption and change of this atmosphere which surrounds us. For this corruption is a pestilence of animals, so far as they are animals, but the other is a pestilence of men, so far as they are men. Do not despise death, but be well content with it, 
since this too is one of those things which nature wills. For such as it is to be young and to grow old, and to increase and to reach maturity, and to have teeth and beard and gray hairs, and to beget and be pregnant, and to bring forth, and all the other natural operations which the seasons of thy life bring, such also is dissolution. This, then, is consistent with the character of a reflecting man, to be neither careless nor impatient, nor contemptuous with respect to death, but to wait for it as one of the operations of nature. As thou now waitest for the time when the child shall come out of thy wife's womb, so be ready for the time when thy soul shall fall out of this envelope. But if thou requirest also a vulgar kind of comfort which shall reach thy heart, thou wilt be made best reconciled to death by observing the objects from which thou art going to be removed, and the morals of those with whom thy soul will no longer be mingled. For it is no way right to be offended with men, but it is thy duty to care for them and to bear with them gently, and yet to remember that thy departure will be not from men who have the same principles as thyself. For this is the only thing, if there be any, which could draw us the contrary way and attach us to life, to be permitted to live with those who have the same principles as ourselves. But now thou seest how great is the trouble arising from the discordance of those who live together, so that thou mayest say, Come quick, O death, lest perchance I too should forget myself. He who does wrong does wrong against himself. He who acts unjustly acts unjustly to himself, because he makes himself bad. He often acts unjustly who does not do a certain thing, not only he who does a certain thing. Thy present opinion, founded on understanding, and thy present conduct, directed to social good, and thy present disposition of contentment with everything which happens, that is enough. Wipe out imagination. Check desire. Extinguish appetite. Keep the ruling faculty in its own power. Among the animals which have not reason, one life is distributed. But among reasonable animals, one intelligent soul is distributed. Just as there is one earth of all things which are of an earthly nature, and we see by one light and breathe one air, all of us that have the faculty of vision, and all that have life. All things which participate in anything which is common to them all move towards that which is of the same kind with themselves. Everything which is earthly turns toward the earth. Everything which is liquid flows together. And everything which is of an aerial kind does the same so that they require something to keep them asunder and the application of force. Fire indeed moves upwards on account of the elemental fire, but it is so ready to be kindled together with all the fire which is here, that even every substance which is somewhat dry is easily ignited, because there is less mingled with it of that which is a hindrance to ignition. Accordingly, then, everything also which participates in the common intelligent nature moves in like manner towards that which is of the same kind with itself, or moves even more. For so much as it is superior in comparison with all other things, in the same degree also it is more ready to mingle with and to be fused with that which is akin to it. Accordingly, among animals devoid of reason, we find swarms of bees and herds of cattle, and the nurture of young birds, and in a manner loves. 
for even in animals there are souls, and that power which brings them together is seen to exert itself in the superior degree, and in such a way as never has been observed in plants, or in stones, nor in trees. But in rational animals there are political communities and friendships, and families and meetings of people, and in wars, treaties, and armistices. But in the things which are still superior, even though they are separated from one another, unity in a manner exists, as in the stars. Thus the ascent to the higher degree is able to produce a sympathy, even in things which are separated. See, then, what now takes place. For only intelligent animals have now forgotten this mutual desire and inclination, and in them alone the property of flowing together is not seen. But still, though men strive to avoid this union, they are caught and held by it, for their nature is too strong for them, and thou wilt see what I say, if thou only observest. Sooner then will one find anything earthy which comes in contact with no earthy thing than a man altogether separated from other men. Both man and God and the universe produce fruit. At the proper seasons each produces it. But if usage has especially fixed these terms to the vine and like things, this is nothing. Reason produces fruit both for all and for itself, and there are produced from it other things of the same kind as reason itself. If thou art able, correct by teaching those who do wrong. But if thou canst not, remember that indulgence is given to thee for this purpose, and the gods too are indulgent to such persons and for some purposes they even help them to get health, wealth, reputation, so kind they are. And it is in thy power also. Or say, who hinders thee? Labor not as one who is wretched, nor yet as one who would be pitied or admired, but direct thy will to one thing only, to put thyself in motion and to check thyself, as the social reason requires. Today I have got out of all trouble, or rather I have cast out all trouble, for it was not outside, but within, and in my opinions. All things are the same, familiar in experience, and ephemeral in time, and worthless in the matter, Everything now is just as it was in the time of those whom we have buried. Things stand outside of us, themselves by themselves, neither knowing aught of themselves, nor expressing any judgment. What is it, then, which does judge about them? The ruling faculty. Not in passivity, but in activity, lie the evil and the good of the rational social animal, just as his virtue and his vice lie not in passivity, but in activity. For the stone which has been thrown up, it is no evil to come down, nor indeed any good to have been carried up. Penetrate inwards into men's leading principles, and thou wilt see what judges thou art afraid of, and what kind of judges they are of themselves. All things are changing, and thou thyself art in continuous mutation, and in a manner in continuous destruction, and the whole universe too. It is thy duty to leave another man's wrongful act there where it is. Termination of activity, cessation from movement and opinion, and in a sense their death is no evil. Turn thy thoughts now to the consideration of thy life, thy life as a child, as a youth, thy manhood, thy old age. 
for in these also every change was a death. Is anything to fear? Turn thy thoughts now to thy life under thy grandfather, then to thy life under thy mother, then to thy life under thy father, as thou findest many other differences and changes and terminations, ask thyself, Is this anything to fear? In like manner, then, neither are the termination and cessation and change of thy whole life a thing to be afraid of. Hasten to examine thy own ruling faculty, and that of the universe, and that of thy neighbor, thy own, that thou mayest make it just, and that of the universe, that thou mayest remember of what thou art a part, and that of thy neighbor, that thou mayest know whether he has acted ignorantly or with knowledge, and that thou mayest also consider that his ruling faculty is akin to thine. As thou art thyself a component part of a social system, so let every act of thine be a component part of social life. Whatever act of thine, then, has no reference, either immediately or remotely, to a social end, this tears asunder thy life, and does not allow it to be one, and is of the nature of a mutiny, just as when in a popular assembly a man acting by himself stands apart from the general agreement. Quarrels of little children and their sports, and poor spirits carrying about dead bodies, such is everything. And so what is exhibited in the representation of the mansions of the dead strikes our eyes more clearly. Examine into the quality of the form of an object and detach it altogether from its material part, and then contemplate it, then determine the time, the longest which a thing of this peculiar form is naturally made to endure. Thou hast endured infinite troubles through not being contented with thy ruling faculty when it does the things which it is constituted by nature to do. But enough of this. When another blames thee or hates thee, or when men say about thee anything injurious, approach their poor souls, penetrate within, and see what kind of men they are. Thou wilt discover that there is no reason to take any trouble that these men may have this or that opinion about thee. However, thou must be well disposed towards them, for by nature they are friends. And the gods, too, aid them in all ways, by dreams, by signs, toward the attainment of those things on which they set a value. The periodic movements of the universe are the same up and down from age to age, and either the universal intelligence puts itself in motion for every separate effect, and if this is so, be thou content with that which is the result of its activity, or it puts itself in motion once, and everything else comes by way of sequence in a manner, or indivisible elements are the origin of all things. In a word, if there is a God, all is well, and if chance rules, do not thou also be governed by it. Soon will the earth cover us all, then the earth too will change, and the things also which result from change will continue to change forever, and these again forever. For if a man reflects on the changes and transformations which follow one another like wave after wave, and their rapidity, he will despise everything which is perishable. The universal cause is like a winter torrent. It carries everything along with it. But how worthless are all these poor people who are engaged in matters political and, as they suppose, are playing the philosopher. All are drivelers. Well, then, man, 
Do what nature now requires. Set thyself in motion. If it is in thy power, and do not look about thee to see if any one will observe it, nor yet expect Plato's Republic, but be content if the smallest thing goes on well, and consider such an event to be no small matter. For who can change men's opinions? And without a change of opinions, what else is there than the slavery of men who groan while they pretend to obey? Come now and tell me of Alexander and Philippus and Demetrius and Phalerum. They themselves shall judge whether they discovered what the common nature required, and train themselves accordingly. But if they acted like tragedy heroes, no one has condemned me to imitate them. Simple and modest is the work of philosophy. Draw me not aside to insolence and pride. Look down from above on the countless herds of men and their countless solemnities, and the infinity varied voyagings into storms and calms, and the differences among those who are born, who live together and die, and consider too the life lived by others in olden time, and the life of those who will live after thee, and the life now lived among barbarous nations, and how many know not even thy name and how many will soon forget it, and how they who perhaps now are praising thee will very soon blame thee, and that neither a posthumous name is of any value, nor reputation, nor anything else. Let there be freedom from perturbations with respect to the things which come from the external cause. And let there be justice in the things done by virtue of the internal cause. That is, let there be movement and action terminating in this, in social acts, for this is according to thy nature. Thou canst remove out of the way many useless things among those which disturb thee, for they lie entirely in thy opinion and thou wilt then gain for thyself ample space by comprehending the whole universe in thy mind, and by contemplating the eternity of time, and observing the rapid change of every several thing, how short is the time from birth to dissolution, and the illimitable time before birth, as well as the equally boundless time after dissolution. All that thou seest will quickly perish, and those who have been spectators of its dissolution will very soon perish too. And he who dies at the extremest old age will be brought into the same condition with him who died prematurely. What are these men's leading principles? And about what kind of things are they busy? And for what kind of reasons do they love and honor? Imagine that thou seest their poor souls laid bare, when they think that they do harm by their blame or good by their praise. What an idea! Loss is nothing else than change. But the universal nature delights in change, and in obedience to her all things are now done well and from eternity have been done in like form, and will be done to such time without end. What then dost thou say, that all things have been, and all things always will be bad, and that no power has ever been found in so many gods to rectify these things, but the world has been condemned to be bound in never-ceasing evil? The rottenness of the matter which is the foundation of everything, water, dust, bones, filth, or again, marble rocks, the callosities of the earth, and gold and silver and sediments and garments, only bits of hair and purple dye, blood and everything else is of the same kind, and that which is of the nature of breath is also another thing of the same kind changing from this to that. 
Enough of this wretched life, and murmurings, and apish tricks. Why art thou disturbed? What is there new in this? What unsettles thee? Is it the form of the thing? Look at it. Or is it the matter? Look at it. But besides these there is nothing. Toward the gods, then, now become at last more simple and better. It is the same whether we examine these things for a hundred years or three. If any man has done wrong, the harm is his own. But perhaps he has not done wrong. Either all things proceed from one intelligent source, and come together as in one body, and the part ought not to find fault with what is done for the benefit of the whole, or there are only atoms, and nothing else than mixture and dispersion. Why, then, art thou disturbed? Say to the ruling faculty, Art thou dead? Art thou corrupted? Art thou playing the hypocrite? Art thou become a beast? Dost thou herd and feed with the rest? Either the gods have no power, or they have power. If then they have no power, why dost thou pray to them? But if they have power, why dost thou not pray for them to give thee the faculty of not fearing any of the things which thou fearest, or of not desiring any of the things which thou desirest? or not being pained at anything, rather than pray that any of these things should not happen or happen. For certainly if they can cooperate with men, they can cooperate for these purposes. But perhaps thou wilt say the gods have placed them in thy power. Well then, is it not better to use what is in thy power like a free man than to desire in a slavish and abject way what is not in thy power? And who has told thee that the gods do not aid us even in the things which are in our power? Begin then to pray for such things, and thou wilt see. One man prays thus, How shall I be able to lie with that woman? Do thou praise thus? How shall I not desire to lie with her? Another prays thus, How shall I be released from this? Another prays, How shall I not desire to be released? Another thus, How shall I not lose my little son? Thou thus, How shall I not be afraid to lose him? In turn, turn thy prayers this way, and see what comes. Epicurus says, In my sickness my conversation was not about my bodily sufferings, nor, says he, did I talk on such subjects to those who visited me? But I continued to discourse on the nature of things as before, keeping to this main point, how the mind while participating in such movements as go on in the poor flesh shall be free from perturbations and maintain its proper good. Nor did I, he says, give the physicians an opportunity of putting on solemn looks as if they were doing something great, but my life went on well and happily. Do then the same that he did, both in sickness, if thou art sick, and in any other circumstances, for never to desert philosophy in any events that may befall us, nor to hold trifling talk either with an ignorant man or with one unacquainted with nature, is a principle of all schools of philosophy, but to be intent only on that which thou art now doing and on the instrument by which thou dost it. When thou art offended with any man's shameless conduct, immediately ask thyself, Is it possible then that shameless men should not be in the world? It is not possible. Do then require what is impossible. For this man also is one of those shameless men who must of necessity be in the world. Let the same considerations be present to thy mind in the case of the knave and the faithless man, and of every man who does wrong in any way. For at the same time that thou dost remind thyself that it is impossible that such kind of men should not exist, 
thou wilt become more kindly disposed toward every one individually. It is useful to perceive this, too, immediately when the occasion arises, that virtue nature has given to man to oppose to every wrongful act. For she has given to man, as an antidote against the stupid man, mildness, and against another kind of man, some other power. And in all cases it is possible for thee to correct thy teaching the man who is gone astray, for every man who errs misses his object and is gone astray. Besides, wherein hast thou been injured? For thou wilt find that no one among those against whom thou art irritated has done anything by which thy mind could be made worse. But that which is evil to thee and harmful has its foundation only in the mind. And what harm is done, or what is there strange, if the man who has not been instructed does the acts of an uninstructed man? Consider whether thou shouldest not rather blame thyself, because thou didst not expect such a man to err in such a way. For thou hast means given thee by thy reason to suppose that it was likely that he would commit this error, and yet thou hast forgotten and art amazed that he has erred. But most of all, when thou blamest him as a father or ungrateful, turn thyself, for the fault is manifestly thy own. Whether thou didst trust that a man who had such a disposition would keep his promise, or when conferring thy kindness thou didst not confer it absolutely, nor yet in such a way as to have received from thy very act all the profit, for what more dost thou want when thou hast done a man a service? Art thou not content that thou hast done something comfortable to thy nature, and dost thou seek to be paid for it? Just as if the eye demanded a recompense for seeing, or the feet for walking. For as these members are formed for a particular purpose, and by working according to their several constitutions, obtain what is their own, so also as man is formed by nature to acts of benevolence, when he has done anything benevolent or in any other way conducive to the common interest, he has acted conformably to his constitution, and he gets what is his own. End of chapter 9 Recorded by Father Ziley, Detroit, June 2007. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, translated by George Long. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 10 Wilt thou then, my soul, never be good and simple and one and naked, more manifest than the body which surrounds thee? Wilt thou never enjoy an affectionate and contented disposition? Wilt thou never be full and without a want of any kind, longing for nothing more nor desiring anything, either animate or inanimate, for the enjoyment of pleasures, nor yet desiring time wherein thou shalt have longer enjoyment or place or pleasant climate or society of men with whom thou mayest live in harmony? But wilt thou be satisfied with thy present condition and pleased with all that is about thee, and wilt thou convince thyself that thou hast everything and that it comes from the gods, that everything is well for thee and will be well whatever shall please them, and whatever they shall give for the conservation of perfect living being, the good and just and beautiful, which generates and holds together all things, and contains and embraces all things which are dissolved for the production of other like things? Wilt thou never be such that thou shalt so dwell in community with gods and men as neither to find fault with them at all? nor to be condemned by them? 2. Observe what thy nature requires. So far as thou art governed by nature only, then do it and accept it. If thy nature, so far as thou art a living being, shall not be made worse by it. And next thou must observe what thy nature requires so far as thou art a living being. 
and all this thou mayest allow thyself, if thy nature, so far as thou art a rational animal, shall not be made worse by it. But the rational animal is consequently also a political animal. Use these rules, then, and trouble thyself about nothing else. 3. Everything which happens, either happens in such wise as thou art formed by nature to bear it, or as thou art not formed by nature to bear it. If then it happens to thee in such a way as thou art formed by nature to bear it, do not complain, but bear it as thou art formed by nature to bear it. But if it happens in such wise as thou art not formed by nature to bear it, do not complain, for it will perish after it has consumed thee. Remember, however, that thou art formed by nature to bear everything, with respect to which it depends on thy own opinion to make it endurable and tolerable, by thinking that it is either thy interest or thy duty to do this. 4. If a man is mistaken, instruct him kindly and show him his error. But if thou art not able, blame thyself, or blame not even thyself. 5. Whatever may happen to thee, it was prepared for thee from all eternity, and the implication of causes was from eternity spinning the thread of thy being, and of that which is incident to it. 6. Whether the universe is a concourse of atoms, or nature is a system, let this first be established, that I am part of the whole which is governed by nature. Next, I am in a manner intimately related to the parts which are of the same kind with myself. For remembering this, inasmuch as I am a part, I shall be discontented with none of the things which are assigned to me out of the whole. For nothing is injurious to the part, if it is for the advantage of the whole. For the whole contains nothing which is not for its advantage. And all natures indeed have this common principle, but the nature of the universe has this principle besides, that it cannot be compelled even by any external cause to generate anything harmful to itself. By remembering, then, that I am part of such a whole, I shall be content with everything that happens. And inasmuch as I am in a manner intimately related to the parts which are of the same kind with myself, I shall do nothing unsocial, but I shall rather direct myself to the things which are of the same kind with myself, and I shall turn all my efforts to the common interest, and divert them from the contrary. Now, if these things are done so, life must flow on happily, just as thou mayest observe that the life of a citizen is happy, who continues a course of action which is advantageous to his fellow citizens, and is content with whatever the state may assign to him. 7. The parts of the whole, everything I mean, which is naturally comprehended in the universe, must of necessity perish. But let this be understood in this sense, that they must undergo change. But if this is naturally both an evil and a necessity for the parts, the whole would not continue to exist in a good condition, the parts being subject to change and constituted so as to perish in various ways. For whether did nature herself design to do evil to the things which are parts of herself, and to make them subject to evil and of necessity fall into evil, or have such results happened without her knowing it? Both these suppositions indeed are incredible. But if a man should ever drop the term nature as an efficient power, and should speak of these things as natural, even then it would be ridiculous to affirm at the same time that the parts of the whole are in their nature subject to change, and at the same time to be surprised or vexed as if something were happening contrary to nature particularly as the dissolution of things into those things of which each thing is composed. For there is either a dispersion of the elements out of which everything has been compounded, or a change from the solid to the earthy, and from the airy to the aerial, so that these parts are taken back into the universal reason, whether this at certain periods is consumed by fire or renewed by eternal changes. And do not imagine that the solid and the airy part belong to thee from time of generation, for all this received its accretion only yesterday, and the day before, as one may say, from the food and the air which is inspired. This, then, which have received the accretion, changes not that which thy mother brought forth. But suppose that this, which thy mother brought forth, implicates thee very much with the other part, which has the peculiar quality of change. This is nothing, in fact, in the way of objection to what is said. 8. 
When thou hast assumed thy names, good, modest, true, rational, a man of equanimity and magnanimous, take care thou dost not change these names, and if thou should lose them, quickly return to them. And remember that the term rational was intended to signify a discriminating attention to every several thing and freedom from negligence, and that equanimity is the voluntary acceptance of the things which are assigned to thee by the common nature and that magnanimity is the elevation of the intelligent part above the pleasurable or painful sensations of the flesh, and above that poor thing called fame, and death, and all such things. If, then, thou maintainest thyself in the possession of these names, without desiring to be called by these names by others, thou wilt be another person and wilt enter on to another life. For to continue to be such as thou hast hitherto been, and to be torn in pieces and defiled in such a life, is the character of a very stupid man, and one over-fond of his life, and like those half-devoured fighters with wild beasts, who, though covered with wounds and gore, still entreat to be kept to the following day, though they will be exposed in the same state to the same claws and bites. Therefore, fix thyself in the possession of these few names, and if thou art able to abide in them, abide as if thou wast removed to certain islands of the happy." But if thou shalt perceive that thou fallest out of them, and dost not maintain thy hold, go courageously into some nook where thou shalt maintain them, or even depart at once from life, not in passion, but with simplicity and freedom and modesty, after doing this one laudable thing at least in thy life, to have gone out of it thus. In order, however, to the remembrance of these names, it will greatly help thee if thou rememberest the gods, and that they wish not to be flattered but wish all reasonable beings to be made like themselves. And if thou rememberest, that which does the work of a fig tree is a fig tree, and that which does the work of a dog is a dog, and that which does the work of a bee is a bee, and that which does the work of man is a man. 9. Mimi, war, astonishment, torpor, slavery will daily wipe out those holy principles of thine. How many things without studying nature dost thou imagine, and how many dost thou neglect? But it is thy duty so to look on and so to do everything, that at the same time the power of dealing with circumstances is perfect, and the contemplative faculty is exercised, and the confidence which comes from the knowledge of each several thing is maintained without showing it, by yet not concealed. For when wilt thou enjoy simplicity, when gravity and when the knowledge of every several thing, both what is in substance and what place it has in the universe, and how long it is formed to exist, and of what things it is compounded, and to whom it can belong, and who are able both to give it and take it away? 10. A spider is proud when it has caught a fly, and another when he has caught a poor hare, and another when he has taken the little fish in a net and another when he has taken wild boars, and another when he has taken bears, and another when he has taken sarmatians. Are not these robbers, if thou examinest their opinions? 11. Acquire the contemplative way of seeing how all things change into one another, and constantly attend to it, and exercise thyself about this part of philosophy. For nothing is so much adapted to produce magnanimity. Such a man has put off the body, and he sees that he must, no one knows how soon, go away from among men and leave everything here. He gives himself up entirely to just doing in all his actions, and in everything else that happens he resigns himself to the universal nature. But as to what any man shall say or think it about him or do against him, he never even thinks of it, being himself contented with these two things, with acting justly in what he now does and being satisfied with what is now assigned to him. And he lays aside all distracting and busy pursuits, and desires nothing else than to accomplish the straight course through the law, and by accomplishing the straight course, to follow God. 12. What need is there of suspicious fear, since it is thy power to inquire what ought to be done? And if thou seest clear, go by this way content, without turning back, but if thou dost not see clear, stop and take the best advisers. But if any other things oppose thee, 
Go on according to thy powers with due consideration, keeping to that which appears to be just. For it is best to reach this object, and if thou dost fail, let thy failure be in attempting this. He who follows reason in all things is both tranquil and active at the same time, and also cheerful and collected. 13. Inquire of thyself, as soon as thou wakest from sleep, whether it will make any difference to thee, if another does what is just and right. It will make no difference. Thou hast not forgotten, I suppose, that those who assume arrogant airs in bestowing their praise or blame on others, are such as they are at bed and at board, and thou hast not forgotten what they do, and what they avoid, and what they pursue, and how they steal and how they rob, not with hands and feet, but with their most valuable part by means of which there is produced, when a man chooses, fidelity, modesty, truth, law, a good demon, and happiness. 14. To her who gives and takes back all, to nature, the man who is instructed and modest says, Give what thou wilt, take back what thou wilt. And he says this not proudly, but obediently and well pleased with her. 15. Short is the little which remains to thee of life. Live as on a mountain, for it makes no difference whether a man lives there or here, if he lives everywhere in the world as in a state. Let men see, let them know a real man who lives according to nature. If they cannot endure him, let them kill him, for that is better than to live like this. 16. No longer talk at all about the kind of man that a good man ought to be, but be such. 17. Constantly contemplate the whole of time and the whole of substance, and consider that all individual things as to substance are as a grain of a fig, and as to time, the turning of a gimlet. 18. Look at everything that exists, and observe that it is already in dissolution and in change, and, as it were, putrefaction or dispersion, or that everything is so constituted by nature as to die. 19. Consider what men are when they are eating, sleeping, generating, easing themselves, and so forth. Then what kind of men they are when they are imperious and arrogant, or angry and scolding from their elevated place. But a short time ago, to how many they were slaves, and for what things? And after a little time, consider in what a condition they will be. 20. That is for the good of each thing, which the universal nature brings to each, and it is for its good at the time when nature brings it. 21. The earth loves a shower, and the solemn aether loves, and the universe loves to make whatever it is about to be. I say then to the universe, that I love as thou lovest, and is not this too said, that this or that loves is wont to be produced? 22. Either thou livest here, and hast already accustomed thyself to it, or thou art going away, and this was on thy own will, or thou art dying, and hast discharged thy duty, but besides these things there is nothing. Be of good cheer, then. 23. Let this always be plain to thee, that this piece of land is like any other, and that all things here are the same with things on top of a mountain, or on the seashore, or wherever thou choosest to be. For thou wilt find just what Plato says, dwelling within the walls of a city as in a shepherd's fold on a mountain. 24. What is my ruling faculty now to me? And of what nature am I now making it? And for what purpose am I now using it? Is it void of understanding? Is it loosed and rent asunder from social life? Is it melted into and mixed with the poor flesh so as to move together with it? 25. He who flies from his master is a runaway, but the law is master, and he who breaks the law is a runaway. And he also who is grieved or angry or afraid is dissatisfied because something has been, or is, or shall be of the things which are appointed by him who rules all things. And he is law, and assigns to every man what is fit. He then who fears or is grieved or is angry is a runaway. 
26. A man deposits seed in a womb and goes away, and then another cause takes it and labors on it and makes a child. What a thing from such a material! Again, the child passes food down the throat, and then another cause takes it and makes it perception and motion, and in fine life and strength and other things, how many and how strange! Observe, then, the things which are produced in such a hidden way, and see the power just as we see the power, which carries things downwards and upwards, not with the eyes, but still no less plainly. 27. Constantly consider how all things such as they now are, in time past also were, and consider that they will be the same again, and place before thy eyes entire dramas and stages of the same form, whatever thou hast learned from thy experience or from older history. For example, the whole court of Hadrianus, and the whole court of Antoninus, and the whole court of Philippus, Alexander, Croesus, for all those were dramas such as we see now, only with different actors. 28. Imagine every man who is grieved at anything or discontented to be like a pig which is sacrificed and kicks and screams. Like this pig also is he who on his bed in silence laments the bonds in which we are held, and consider that only to the rational animal is it given to follow voluntarily what happens, but simply to follow as a necessity imposed on all. 29. Severally on the occasion of everything that thou dost, pause and ask thyself if death is a dreadful thing because it deprives thee of this. 30. When thou art offended at any man's fault, forthwith turn to thyself and reflect in what like manner thou dost err thyself, for example, in thinking that money is a good thing, or pleasure, or a bit of reputation, and the like. For by attending to this thou wilt quickly forget thy anger, if this consideration also is added, that the man is compelled, for what else could he do? Or, if thou art able, take away from him the compulsion. 31. When thou hast seen Satron the Socratic, think of Eutyches or Hymen. And when thou hast seen Euphrates, think of Eutychion or Silvanus. And when thou hast seen Alciphron, think of Troipophorus. And when thou hast seen Xenophon, think of Credo of Severus. And when thou hast looked on thyself, think of any other Caesar. And, in the case of every one, do in like manner. Then let this thought be in thy mind. Where, then, are those men? Nowhere. Or nobody knows where. For thus continuously thou wilt look at human things as smoke and nothing at all, especially if thou reflectest at the same time that what is once changed will never exist again in the infinite duration of time. But thou, in what a brief space of time is thy existence? And why art thou not content to pass through this short time in an orderly way? What matter and opportunity for thy activity art thou avoiding? For what else are all these things except exercises for the reason, when it has viewed carefully and by examination into their nature the things which happen in life? Persevere then until thou shalt have made these things thy own, as the stomach which is strengthened makes all things its own, as the blazing fire makes flame and brightness out of everything that is thrown into it. Thirty two. Let it not be in any man's power to say truly of thee that thou art not simple or that thou art not good, but let him be a liar whoever shall think anything of this kind about thee, and this is altogether in thy power. For who is he that shall hinder thee from being good and simple? Do thou only determine to live no longer, unless thou shalt be such? For neither does reason allow thee to live if thou art not such. 33. What is that which as to this material our life can be done or said in a way most conformable to reason? For whatever this may be, it is in thy power to do it or say it, and do not make excuses that thou art hindered. Thou wilt not cease to lament till thy mind is in such a condition that, what luxury is to those who enjoy pleasure, such shall be to thee in the matter which is subjected and presented to thee the doing of things which are conformable to man's constitution. For a man ought to consider as an enjoyment everything which is in his power to do according to his own nature. 
and it is in his power everywhere. Now, it is not given to a cylinder to move everywhere by its own motion, nor yet water, nor to fire, nor to anything else which is governed by nature of an irrational soul, for the things which check them and stand in the way are many. But intelligence and reason are able to go through everything that opposes them, and in such manner as they are formed by nature and as they choose. Place before thy eyes this facility with which the reason will be carried through all things, as fire upwards, as a stone downwards, as a cylinder down an inclined surface, and seek nothing further. For all other obstacles either affect the body only, which is a dead thing, or, except through opinion and the yielding of the reason itself, they do not crush nor do any harm of any kind, for if they did, he who felt it would immediately become bad. Now in the case of all things which have a certain constitution, whatever harm may happen to any of them, that which is so affected becomes consequently worse. But in the like case a man becomes both better, if one may say so, and more worthy of praise by making a right use of these accidents. And finally, remember that nothing harms him who is really a citizen, which does not harm the state, nor yet does anything harm the state which does not harm law, and of these things which are called misfortunes, not one harms law. What then does not harm law does not harm either state or citizen. 34. To him who is penetrated by true principles, even the briefest precept is sufficient, and any common precept, to remind him that he should be free from grief and fair. For example, Leaves, some the wind scatters on the ground. So is the race of men. Leaves also are thy children, and leaves too are they who cry out as if they were worthy of credit and bestow their praise, or on the contrary curse, or secretly blame and sneer, and leaves in like manner are those who shall receive and transmit a man's fame to aftertimes. For all such things as these, quote, are produced in the season of spring, end quote, as the poet says. But the wind casts them down, then the forest produces other leaves in their places. But a brief existence is common to all things, and yet thou avoidest and pursuest all things as if they would be eternal. A little time, and thou shalt close thy eyes, and him who has attended thee to thy grave, another soon will lament. 35. The healthy eye ought to see all visible things, and not to say, I wish for green things, for this is the condition of a diseased eye. And the healthy hearing and smelling ought to be ready to perceive all that can be heard and smelled. And the healthy stomach ought to be with respect to all food just as the mill with respect to all things which it is formed to grind. And accordingly, the healthy understanding ought to be prepared for everything which happens, but that which says, Let my dear children live, and let all men praise whatever I may do, is an eye which seeks for green things, or teeth which seek for soft things. 36. There is no man so fortunate that there shall not be by him when he is dying, some who were pleased with what is going to happen. Suppose that he was a good and wise man. Will there not be at last someone to say to himself, Let us at last breathe freely, being relieved from this schoolmaster? It is true that he was harsh to none of us, but I perceive that he tacitly condemns us. This is what is said of a good man. But in our own case, how many other things are there for which there are many who wish to get rid of us? Thou wilt consider this then when thou art dying, and thou wilt depart more contentedly by reflecting thus. I am going away from such a life, in which even my associates, in behalf of whom I have striven so much, prayed and cared, themselves wished me to depart, hoping perchance to get some little advantage by it. Why, then, should a man cling to a longer stay here? Do not, however, for this reason go away less kindly disposed to them, but preserving thy own character and friendly and benevolent and mild, and on the other hand not as if thou wast torn away, but as a man who dies a quiet death. The poor soul is easily separated from the body. Such also ought thy departure from men to be, 
for nature united thee to them and associated thee. But does she now dissolve the union? Well, I am separated as from kinsmen, not, however, dragged resisting, but without compulsion, for this, too, is one of the things according to nature. 37. Accustom thyself as much as possible on the occasion of anything being done by any person to inquire with thyself, for what object is this man doing this? But begin with thyself and examine thyself first. 38. Remember that this which pulls the strings is the thing which is hidden within. This is the power of persuasion. This is life. This, if one may say so, is man. In contemplating thyself, never include the vessel which surrounds thee, and these instruments were attached about it. For they are like to an axe, differing only in this, that they grow to the body. For indeed there is no more use in these parts, without the cause which moves and checks them, than in the weaver's shuttle, and the writer's pen, and the driver's whip. End of section 10. Chapter 11 of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Translated by George Long. Chapter 11. These are the properties of the rational soul. It sees itself, analyzes itself, and makes itself such as it chooses. The fruit which it bears itself enjoys. For the fruit of plants and that in animals which corresponds to fruits others enjoy. It obtains its own end, wherever the limit of life may be fixed. Not as in a dance and in a play and in such like things, where the whole action is incomplete, if anything cuts it short, but in every part and wherever it may be stopped, it makes what has been set before it full and complete, so that it can say, I have what is my own. And further, it traverses the whole universe and the surrounding vacuum, and surveys its form, and it extends itself into the infinity of time, and embraces and comprehends the periodical renovation of all things and it comprehends that those who come after us will see nothing new, nor have those before us seen anything more. But in a manner he who is forty years old, if he has any understanding at all, has seen by virtue of the uniformity that prevails all things which have been, and all that will be. This too is a property of the rational soul, love of one's neighbor, and truth, and modesty and to value nothing more than itself, which is also the property of law. Thus, then, right reason differs not at all from the reason of justice. Thou wilt set little value on pleasing song and dancing in the pancratium, if thou wilt distribute the melody of the voice into its several sounds, and ask thyself as to each if thou art mastered by this for thou wilt be prevented by shame from confessing it. And in the matter of dancing, if at each movement and attitude thou wilt do the same, and the like also in the matter of the pancratium. In all things, then, except virtue and the acts of virtue, remember to apply thyself to their several parts, and by this division to come to value them little, and apply this rule also to thy whole life. What a soul that is which is ready, if at any moment it must be separated from the body, and ready to be extinguished, or dispersed, or continue to exist. But so that this readiness comes from a man's own judgment, not from mere obstinacy, as with the Christians, but considerately, and with dignity, 
and in a way to persuade another, without tragic show. Have I done something for the general interest? Well, then, I have had my reward. Let this always be present to thy mind, and never stop doing such good. What is thy art? To be good. And how is this accomplished well, except by general principles, some about the nature of the universe, and others about the proper constitution of man? At first, tragedies were brought on the stage as means of reminding men of the things which happened to them, and that it is according to nature for things to happen so, and that if you are delighted with what is shown on the stage, you should not be troubled with that which takes place on the larger stage. For you see that these things must be accomplished thus, and that even they bear them who cry out, O Sithiron! And indeed, some things are said well by the dramatic writers, of which kind is the following especially. Me and my children, if the gods neglect, this has its reason too. And again, we must not chafe and fret at that which happens. And life's harvest reap like the wheat's fruitful ear. And other things of the same kind. After tragedy, the old comedy was introduced, which had a magisterial freedom of speech, and by its very plainness of speaking was useful in reminding men to beware of insolence, and for this purpose too Diogenes used to take from these writers. But as to the middle comedy which came next, observe what it was, and again, for what object the new comedy was introduced, which gradually sunk down into a mere mimic artifice. That some good things are said even by these writers, everybody knows. But the whole plan of such poetry and dramaturgy, to what end does it look? How plain does it appear that there is not another condition of life so well suited for philosophizing as this in which thou now happenest to be? A branch cut off from the adjacent branch must of necessity be cut off from the whole tree also. So to a man, when he is separated from another man, has fallen off from the whole social community. Now as to a branch, another cuts it off, but a man by his own act separates himself from his neighbor when he hates him, and turns away from him, and he does not know that he has at the same time cut himself off from the whole social system. Yet he has this privilege certainly from Zeus who frames society, for it is in our power to grow again to that which is near to us, and again to become a part which helps us to make up the whole. However, if it often happens, this kind of separation, it makes it difficult for that which detaches itself to be brought to unity, and to be restored to its former condition. Finally, the branch, which from the first grew together with the tree, and has continued to have one life with it, is not like that which, after being cut off, is then ingrafted. For this is something like what the gardeners mean, when they say that it grows with the rest of the tree, but that it has not the same mind with it. As those who try to stand in thy way, when thou art proceeding according to right reason, will not be able to turn thee aside from thy proper action, so neither let them drive thee from thy benevolent feelings towards them but be on thy guard equally in both matters, not only in the matter of steady judgment and action, but also in the matter of gentleness towards those who try to hinder or otherwise trouble thee. For this is also a weakness, to be vexed at them, as well as to be diverted from thy course of action, and to give way through fear. For both are equally deserters from their post, the man who does it through fear, and the man who is alienated from him who is by nature a kinsman and a friend. There is no nature which is inferior to art, for the arts imitate the natures of things. But if this is so, that nature which is the most perfect, and the most comprehensive of all natures, cannot fall short of the skill of art. Now all arts do the inferior things for the sake of the superior. Therefore the universal nature does so too. And, indeed, hence is the origin of justice and in justice the other virtues have their foundation. For justice will not be observed, 
if we either care for middle things, things indifferent, or are easily deceived, and careless, and changeable. If the things do not come to thee, the pursuits and avoidances of which disturb thee, still, in a manner, thou goest to them. Let then thy judgment about them be at rest, and they will remain quiet, and thou wilt not be seen either pursuing or avoiding. The spherical form of the soul maintains its figure, when it is neither extended toward any object, nor contracted inwards, nor dispersed, nor sinks down, but is illuminated by light, by which it sees the truth, the truth of all things, and the truth that is in itself. Suppose any man shall despise me. Let him look to that himself. But I will look to this that I be not discovered doing or saying anything deserving of contempt. Shall any man hate me? Let him look to it. But I will be mild and benevolent towards every man, and ready to show even him his mistake, not reproachfully, nor yet as making a display of my endurance, but nobly and honestly, like the great Phocion, unless indeed he only assumed it. For the interior parts ought to be such, and a man ought to be seen by the gods neither dissatisfied with anything, nor complaining. For what evil is it to thee, if thou art now doing what is agreeable to thy own nature, and art satisfied with that which at this moment is suitable to the nature of the universe, since thou art a human being placed at thy post, in order that what is for the common advantage may be done in some way? Men despise one another and flatter one another and men wish to raise themselves above one another, and crouch before one another. How unsound and insincere is he who says, I have determined to deal with thee in a fair way. What art thou doing, man? There is no occasion to give this notice. It will soon show itself by acts. The voice ought to be plainly written on the forehead. Such as a man's character is, he immediately shows it in his eyes just as he who is beloved forthwith reads everything in the eyes of lovers. The man who is honest and good ought to be exactly like a man who smells strong, so that the bystander, as soon as he comes near him, must smell whether he choose or not. But the affectation of simplicity is like a crooked stick. Nothing is more disgraceful than a wolfish friendship. Avoid this most of all. The good and simple and benevolent show all these things in the eyes, and there is no mistaking. As to living in the best way, this power is in the soul, if it be indifferent to things which are indifferent. And it will be indifferent if it looks on each of these things separately and altogether, and if it remembers that not one of them produces in us an opinion about itself, nor comes to us, but these things remain immovable, and it is we ourselves who produce the judgments about them, and, as we may say, write them in ourselves, it being in our power not to write them, and it being in our power, if perchance these judgments have imperceptibly got a mission to our minds, to wipe them out. And if we remember also that such attention will only be for a short time, and then life will be at an end. Besides, what trouble is there at all in doing this? For if these things are according to nature, rejoice in them, and they will be easy to thee. But if contrary to nature, seek what is conformable to thy own nature, and strive towards this, even if it bring no reputation. For every man is allowed to seek his own good. Consider whence each thing is come, and of what it consists, and into what it changes and what kind of a thing it will be when it is changed, and that it will sustain no harm. If any have offended against thee, consider first. What is my relation to men, and that we are made for one another, and in another respect I was made to be set over them, as a ram over the flock or a bull over the herd? But examine the matter from first principles, from this, if all things are not mere atoms, it is nature which orders all things. If this is so, 
the inferior things exist for the sake of the superior, and these for the sake of one another. Second, consider what kind of men they are at table, in bed, and so forth, and particularly, under what compulsions in respect of opinions they are, and as to their acts, consider with what pride they do what they do. Third, that if men do rightly what they do, we ought not to be displeased, but if they do not right, it is plain that they do so involuntarily, and in ignorance. For as every soul is unwillingly deprived of the truth, so also it is unwillingly deprived of the power of behaving to each man according to his deserts. Accordingly, men are pained when they are called unjust, ungrateful, and greedy, and in a word wrongdoers to their neighbors. Fourth, consider that thou also doest many things wrong, and that thou art a man like others, and even if thou dost abstain from certain faults, still thou hast the disposition to commit them, though either through cowardice, or concern about reputation, or some such mean motive, thou dost abstain from such faults. Fifth, consider that thou dost not even understand whether men are doing wrong or not, for many things are done with a certain reference to circumstances. And in short, a man must learn a great deal to enable him to pass a correct judgment on another man's acts. Sixth, consider when thou art much vexed or grieved that man's life is only a moment, and after a short time we are all laid out dead. Seventh, that it is not men's acts which disturb us, for those acts have their foundation in men's ruling principles, but it is our own opinions which disturb us. Take away these opinions, then, and resolve to dismiss thy judgment about an act as if it were something grievous, and thy anger is gone. How, then, shall I take away these opinions? By reflecting that no wrongful act of another brings shame on thee. For unless that which is shameful is alone bad, thou also must of necessity do many things wrong, and become a robber in everything else. Eighth, consider how much more pain is brought on us by the anger and vexation caused by such acts than by the acts themselves at which we are angry and vexed. Ninth, consider that a good disposition is invincible, if it be genuine, and not an affected smile and acting a part. For what will the most violent man do to thee, if thou continuest to be of a kind disposition towards him, and if, as opportunity offers, thou gently admonishest him, and calmly correctest his errors at the very time when he is trying to do thee harm, saying, Not so, my child. We are constituted by nature for something else. I shall certainly not be injured, but thou art injuring thyself, my child. And show him with gentle tact and by general principles that this is so, and that even bees do not do as he does, nor any animals which are formed by nature to be gregarious. And thou must not do this neither with any double meaning, nor in the way of reproach, but affectionately, and without any rancor in thy soul. And not as if thou wert lecturing him, nor yet that any bystander may admire, but either when he is alone, and if others are present. Remember these nine rules, as if thou hadst received them as a gift from the muses, and begin at last to be a man while thou livest. But thou must equally avoid flattering men and being vexed at them, for both are unsocial and lead to harm. And let this truth be present to thee in the excitement of anger, that to be moved by passion is not manly, but that mildness and gentleness, as they are more agreeable to human nature, so also are they more manly. And he who possesses these qualities possesses strength, nerves, and courage, and not the man who is subject to fits of passion and discontent. For in the same degree in which a man's mind is nearer to freedom from all passion, in the same degree also is it nearer to strength. And as the sense of pain is a characteristic of weakness, so also is anger. For he who yields to pain, and he who yields to anger, both are wounded, and both submit. But if thou wilt, receive also a tenth present from the leader of the muses, Apollo, and it is this, that to expect bad men not to do wrong is madness, for he who expects this desires an impossibility. 
but to allow men to behave so to others, and to expect them not to do thee any wrong, is irrational and tyrannical. There are four principal aberrations of the superior faculty, against which thou shouldst be constantly on thy guard, and when thou hast detected them, thou shouldst wipe them out, and say on each occasion thus, This thought is not necessary. This tends to destroy social union. This which thou art going to say comes not from the real thoughts. For thou shouldst consider it among the most absurd of things, for a man not to speak from his real thoughts. But the fourth is when thou shalt reproach thyself for anything. For this is an evidence of the diviner part within thee being overpowered, and yielding to the less honorable, and to the perishable part, the body, and to its gross pleasures. Thy aerial part, and all the fiery parts which are mingled in thee, though by nature they have an upward tendency, still in obedience to the disposition of the universe they are overpowered here in the compound mass, the body. And also the whole of the earthy part in thee, and the watery, though their tendency is downwards, still are raised up, and occupy a position which is not their natural one. In this manner, then, the elemental parts obey the universal, for when they have been fixed in any place, perforce they remain there, until again the universal shall sound the signal for dissolution. Is it not then strange that thy intelligent part only should be disobedient, and discontented with its own place? And yet no force is imposed on it, but only those things which are conformable to its nature. Still it does not submit, but is carried in the opposite direction. For the movement toward injustice and intemperance, and to anger and grief and fear, is nothing else than the act of one who deviates from nature. And also when the ruling faculty is discontented with anything that happens, then too it deserts its post for it is constituted for piety and reverence toward the gods, no less than for justice. For these qualities also are comprehended under the generic term of contentment with the constitution of things, and indeed they are prior to acts of justice. He who has not one and always the same object in life cannot be one and the same all through his life. But what I have said is not enough, unless this also is added what this object ought to be. For as there is not the same opinion about all the things which in some way or other are considered by the majority to be good, but only about some certain things, that is, things which concern the common interest, so also we ought to propose to ourselves an object which shall be of a common kind, social and political. For he who directs all his own efforts to this object will make all his acts alike, and thus will always be the same. Think of the country mouse, and of the town mouse, and of the alarm and trepidation of the town mouse. Socrates used to call the opinions of the many by the name of lamii, bugbears to frighten children. The Lacedaemonians, at their public spectacles, used to set seats in the shade for strangers, but themselves sat down anywhere. Socrates excused himself to Perdiccas for not going to him, saying, It is because I would not perish by the worst of all ends. That is, I would not receive a favor, and then be unable to return it. In the writings of the Ephesians there was this precept, constantly to think of someone of the men of former times who practiced virtue. The Pythagoreans bid us in the morning look to the heavens, that we may be reminded of those bodies which continually do the same things, and in the same manner perform their work, and also be reminded of their purity and nudity, for there is no veil over a star. Consider what a man Socrates was when he dressed himself in a skin, after Xanthippe had taken his cloak and gone out and what Socrates said to his friends who were ashamed of him, and drew back from him when they saw him dressed thus. Neither in writing nor in reading wilt thou be able to lay down rules for others, before thou shalt have learned to obey rules thyself. Much more is this so in life. A slave thou art, free speech is not for thee. 
and my heart laughed within. Odyssey 9.4.13 And virtue they will curse, speaking harsh words. Hesiod Works and Days 184 To look for the fig in winter is a madman's act. Such is he who looks for his child when it is no longer allowed. Epictetus 3.24.87 when a man kisses his child, said Epictetus, he should whisper to himself, Tomorrow, perchance, thou wilt die. But those are words of bad omen. No word is a word of bad omen, said Epictetus, which expresses any work of nature. Or, if it is so, it is also a word of bad omen to speak of the ears of corn being reaped. Epictetus 3.24.88 the unripe grape, the ripe bunch, the dried grape, all are changes, not into nothing, but into something which exists not yet. Epictetus 3.24 No man can rob us of our free will. Epictetus 3.22.105 Epictetus also said, A man must discover an art, or rules, with respect to giving his assent, and in respect to his movements, he must be careful that they be made with regard to circumstances, that they be consistent with social interests, that they have regard to the value of the object, and as to sensual desire, he should altogether keep away from it, and as to avoidance, he should not show it with respect to any of the things which are not in our power. The dispute, then, he said, is not about any common matter, what about being mad, or not? Socrates used to say, What do you want, souls of rational men or irrational? Souls of rational men. Of what rational men, sound or unsound? Sound. Why then do you not seek for them? Because we have them. Why then do you fight and quarrel? End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Translated by George Long. Chapter 12. All those things at which thou wishest to arrive by a circuitous road, thou canst have now, if thou dost not refuse them to thyself. And this means, if thou wilt, take no notice of all the past, and trust the future to providence, and direct the present only conformably to piety and justice. Conformably to piety, that thou mayest be content with the lot which is assigned to thee, for nature designed it for thee, and thee for it. Conformably to justice, that thou mayest always speak the truth freely, and without disguise, and do the things which are agreeable to law, and according to the worth of each. And let neither another man's wickedness hinder thee, nor opinion, nor voice, nor yet the sensations of the poor flesh which has grown about thee, for the passive part will look to this. If then, whatever the time may be when thou shalt be near to thy departure, neglecting everything else, thou shalt respect only thy ruling faculty and the divinity within thee. And if thou shalt be afraid, not because thou must sometimes cease to live, but if thou shalt fear never to have begun to live according to nature, then thou wilt be a man worthy of the universe which has produced thee and thou wilt cease to be a stranger in thy native land, and to wonder at things which happen daily as if they were something unexpected, and to be dependent on this or that. God sees the minds of all men, bared of the material vesture, and rind, and impurities. For with his intellectual part alone, he touches the intelligence only which has flowed and been derived from himself into these bodies. And if thou also usest thyself to do this, 
thou wilt rid thyself of thy much trouble. For he who regards not the poor flesh which envelops him, surely will not trouble himself by looking after raiment and dwelling and fame and such like externals and show. The things are three of which thou art composed, a little body, a little breath, intelligence. Of these the first two are thine, so far as it is thy duty to take care of them. But the third alone is properly thine. Therefore, if thou shalt separate from thyself, that is, from thy understanding, whatever others do or say, and whatever thou hast done or said thyself, and whatever future things trouble thee because they may happen, and whatever in the body which envelops thee, or in the breath, which is by nature associated with the body, is attached to thee independent of thy will, and whatever the external circumfluent vortex whirls round, so that the intellectual power exempt from the things of fate can live pure and free by itself, doing what is just, and accepting what happens, and saying the truth. If thou wilt separate, I say, from this ruling faculty the things which are attached to it, by the impressions of sense, and the things of time to come, and of time that is past, and wilt make thyself like Empedocles a sphere, all round, and in its joyous rest reposing. And if thou shalt strive to live only what is really thy life, that is, the present, then thou wilt be able to pass that portion of life which remains for thee up to the time of thy death, free from perturbations, nobly and obedient to the God that is within thee. I have often wondered how it is that every man loves himself more than all the rest of men, but yet sets less value on his own opinion of himself than on the opinion of others. If then a god or a wise teacher should present himself to a man, and bid him to think of nothing, and to design nothing which he would not express as soon as he conceived it, he could not endure it even for a single day. So much more respect have we to what our neighbors shall think of us, than to what we shall think of ourselves. How can it be that the gods, after having arranged all things well and benevolently for mankind, have overlooked this alone, that some men, and very good men, and men who, as we may say, have had most communion with the divinity, and through pious acts and religious observances, have been most intimate with the divinity, when they have once died should never exist again, but should be completely extinguished. But if this is so, be assured that if it ought to have been otherwise, the gods would have done it. For if it were just, it would also be possible. And if it were according to nature, nature would have had it so. But because it is not so, if in fact it is not so, be thou convinced that it ought not to have been so. For thou seest even of thyself that in this inquiry thou art disputing with the deity, and we should not thus dispute with the gods, unless they were most excellent and most just. But if this is so, they would not have allowed anything in the ordering of the universe to be neglected unjustly and irrationally. Practice thyself even in the things which thou despairest of accomplishing. For even the left hand, which is ineffectual for all other things for want of practice, holds the bridle more vigorously than the right hand, for it has been practiced in this. Consider in what condition, both in body and soul, a man should be when he is overtaken by death. And consider the shortness of life, the boundless abyss of time, past and future, the feebleness of all matter. Contemplate the formative principles of things bare of their coverings, the purposes of actions. Consider what pain is, what pleasure is, and death and fame, who is to himself the cause of his uneasiness, how no man is hindered by another, that everything is opinion. In the application of thy principles, 
Thou must be like the Pancratiast, not like the Gladiator. For the Gladiator lets fall the sword which he uses, and is killed. But the other always has his hand, and needs to do nothing else than use it. See what things are in themselves, dividing them into matter, form, and purpose. What a power man has to do, nothing except what God will approve, and to accept all that God may give him. With respect to that which happens conformably to nature, we ought to blame neither gods, for they do nothing wrong either voluntarily or involuntarily, nor men, for they do nothing wrong except involuntarily. Consequently, we should blame nobody. How ridiculous, and what a stranger he is, who is surprised at anything which happens in life. Either there is a fatal necessity and invincible order, or a kind providence, or a confusion without a purpose and without a director. If, then, there is an invincible necessity, why dost thou resist? But if there is a providence which allows itself to be propitiated, make thyself worthy of the help of the divinity. But if there is a confusion without a governor, be content that, in such a tempest, thou hast in thyself a certain ruling intelligence. And even if the tempest carry thee away, let it carry away the poor flesh, the poor breath, everything else, for the intelligence, at least, it will not carry away. Does the light of the lamp shine without losing its splendor until it is extinguished? And shall the truth which is in thee, and justice, and temperance, be extinguished before thy death? When a man has presented the appearance of having done wrong, say, How then do I know if this is a wrongful act? And even if he has done wrong, how do I know that he has not condemned himself? And so this is like tearing his own face. Consider that he who would not have the bad man do wrong is like the man who would not have the fig tree to bear juice in the figs, and infants to cry, and the horse to neigh and whatever else must of necessity be. For what must a man do who has such a character? If then thou art irritable, cure this man's disposition. If it is not right, do not do it. If it is not true, do not say it. In everything, always observe what the thing is which produces for thee an appearance, and resolve it by dividing it into the formal, the material, the purpose, and the time within which it must end. Perceive at last that thou hast in thee something better and more divine than the things which cause the various effects, and as it were pull thee by the strings. What is there now in my mind? Is it fear, or suspicion, or desire, or anything of the kind? First, do nothing inconsiderately, nor without a purpose. Second, make thy acts refer to nothing else than to a social end. Consider that before long thou wilt be nobody and nowhere, nor will any of the things exist which thou now seest nor any of those who are now living. For all things are formed by nature to change, and be turned, and to perish, in order that other things in continuous succession may exist. Consider that everything is opinion, and opinion is in thy power. Take away, then, when thou choosest, thy opinion, and, like a mariner who has doubled the promontory, thou wilt find calm, everything stable, and a waveless bay. Any one activity, wherever it may be, when it is ceased at its proper time, suffers no evil because it is ceased, 
nor he who has done this act, does he suffer any evil for this reason that the act has ceased. In like manner, then, the whole which consists of all the acts which is our life, if it cease at its proper time, suffers no evil for this reason that it has ceased. Nor he who has terminated this series at the proper time has he been ill dealt with. But the proper time and the limit nature fixes, sometimes, as in old age, the peculiar nature of man, but always the universal nature, by the change of whose parts the whole universe continues ever young and perfect. And everything which is useful to the universal is always good and in season. Therefore the termination of life for every man is no evil, because neither is it shameful, since it is both independent of the will and not opposed to the general interest. But it is good, since it is seasonable and profitable to and congruent with the universal. For thus, too, he is moved by the deity, who is moved in the same manner with the deity, and moved towards the same things in his mind. These three principles thou must have in readiness. In the things which thou doest, do nothing either inconsiderately, or otherwise as justice herself would act. But with respect to what may happen to thee from without, consider that it happens either by chance, or according to providence, and thou must neither blame chance, nor accuse providence. Second, consider what every being is, from the seed to the time of its receiving a soul, and from the reception of a soul to the giving back of the same, and of what things every being is compounded, and into what things it is resolved. Third, if thou shouldest suddenly be raised up above the earth, and shouldest look down on human beings, and observe the variety of them, how great it is, and at the same time also shouldest see at a glance how great is the number of beings who dwell all around in the air and the ether, consider that as often as thou shouldest be raised up, thou wouldest see the same things, sameness of form, and shortness of duration. Are these things to be proud of? Cast away opinion, thou art saved. Who then hinders thee from casting it away? When thou art troubled about anything, thou hast forgotten this, that all things happen according to the universal nature and forgotten this, that a man's wrongful act is nothing to thee. And further, thou hast forgotten this, that everything which happens, always happens so, and will happen so, and now happens so everywhere. Forgotten this, too, how close is the kinship between a man and the whole human race, for it is a community, not of a little blood or seed, but of intelligence. And thou hast forgotten this, too, that every man's intelligence is a god, and is an efflux of the deity. And forgotten this, that nothing is a man's own, but that his child and his body and his very soul came from the deity. Forgotten this, that everything is opinion. And lastly, thou hast forgotten that every man lives the present time only, and loses only this. Constantly bring to thy recollection those who have complained greatly about anything, those who have been most conspicuous by the greatest fame or misfortunes, or enmities or fortunes of any kind. Then think, where are they all now? Smoke and ash and a tail, or not even a tail. And let there be present to thy mind also everything of this sort, how Fabius Catilinus lived in the country, and Lucius Lupus in his gardens, and Sturtinius at Baiae, and Tiberius at Caprii, and Rufus at Velia. And, in fine, think of the eager pursuit of anything conjoined with pride, and how worthless everything is, after which men violently strain, and how much more philosophical it is for a man in the opportunities presented to him to show himself just, temperate, obedient to the gods, and to do this with all simplicity. 
for the pride which is proud of its want of pride is the most intolerable of all. To those who ask, Where hast thou seen the gods, or how dost thou comprehend that they exist, and so worshipest them? I answer, in the first place, they may be seen even with the eyes. In the second place, neither have I seen even my own soul, and yet I honor it. Thus, then, with respect to the gods, from what I constantly experience of their power, from this I comprehend that they exist, and I venerate them. The safety of life is this, to examine everything all through, what it is itself, what is its material, what the formal part, with all thy soul to do justice and to say the truth. What remains except to enjoy life by joining one good thing to another so as not to leave even the smallest intervals between? There is one light of the sun, though it is interrupted by walls, mountains, and other things infinite. There is one common substance, though it is distributed among countless bodies which have their several qualities. There is one soul, though it is distributed among infinite natures and individual circumscriptions. There is one intelligent soul, though it seems to be divided. Now, in the things which have been mentioned, all the other parts, such as those which are air and matter, are without sensation and have no fellowship, and yet even these parts the intelligent principle holds together, and the gravitation towards the same. But intellect, in a peculiar manner, tends to that which is of the same kin, and combines with it, and the feeling for communion is not interrupted. What dost thou wish? To continue to exist? Well, dost thou wish to have sensation, movement, growth? And then again to cease to grow, to use thy speech, to think? What is there of all these things which seems to thee worth desiring? But if it is easy to set little value on all these things, turn to that which remains, which is to follow reason and God. But it is inconsistent with honoring reason and God to be troubled, because by death a man will be deprived of the other things. How small a part of the boundless and unfathomable time is assigned to every man, for it is very soon swallowed up in the eternal, and how small a part of the whole substance, and how small a part of the universal soul, and on what a small clod of the whole earth thou creepest. Reflecting on all this, consider nothing to be great, except to act as thy nature leads thee, and to endure that which the common nature brings. How does the ruling faculty make use of itself? For all lies in this. But everything else, whether it is in the power of thy will or not, is only lifeless ashes and smoke. This reflection is most adapted to move us to contempt of death, that, even those who think pleasure to be a good, and pain an evil, still have despised it. The man to whom that only is good which comes in due season, and to whom it is the same thing whether he has done more or fewer acts conformable to right reason, and to whom it makes no difference whether he contemplates the world for a longer or a shorter time, for this man neither is death a terrible thing. Man, thou hast been a citizen in this great state, the world. What difference does it make to thee, whether for five years or three? For that which is conformable to the laws is just for all. Where is the hardship, then, if no tyrant, nor yet an unjust judge, sends thee away from the state, but nature who brought thee into it? the same as if a praetor who is employed an actor dismisses him from the stage. But I have not finished the five acts, but only three of them. Thou sayest well, but in life the three acts are the whole drama. For what shall be a complete drama is determined by him who was once the cause of its composition, 
and now of its dissolution. But thou art the cause of neither. Depart, then, satisfied, for he also who releases thee is satisfied. End of chapter 12「Marcus Antoninus was born at Rome A.D. 121 on the 26th of April. His father Aeneas Verus died while he was praetor. His mother was Domitia Calvilla, also named Lucilla. The emperor Titus Antoninus Pius married Aenea Galeria Faustina, the sister of Aeneas Verus, and was consequently the uncle of Marcus Antoninus. When Hadrian adopted Antoninus Pius and declared him his successor in the empire, Antoninus Pius adopted both Lucius Saonius Commodus, the son of Elius Caesar, and Marcus Antoninus, whose original name was Marcus Aeneas Verus. Antoninus then took the name of Marcus Elius Aurelius Verus, to which was added the title of Caesar in A.D. 139. The name Elius belonged to Hadrian's family, and Aurelius was the name of Antoninus Pius. When Marcus Antoninus became Augustus, he dropped the name of Verus and took the name of Antoninus. Accordingly, he is generally named Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, or simply Marcus Antoninus. The youth was most carefully brought up. He thanks the gods that he had good grandfathers, good parents, a good sister, good teachers, good associates, good kinsmen and friends, nearly everything good. He had the happy fortune to witness the example of his uncle and adoptive father Antoninus Pius, and he has recorded in his work the virtues of this excellent man and prudent ruler. Like many young Romans, he tried his hand at poetry and studied rhetoric. Herodes Atticus and Marcus Cornelius Fronto were his teachers in eloquence. There are extant letters between Fronto and Marcus, which show the great affection of the pupil for the master, and the master's great hopes of his industrious pupil. Footnote. Marcus Cornelii Frontonis Reliquii, Berlin, 1816. There are a few letters between Fronto and Antoninus Pius. In footnote. Marcus Antoninus mentions Fronto among those to whom he was indebted for his education. When he was eleven years old, he assumed the dress of philosophers, something plain and coarse, became a hard student, and lived a most laborious, abstemious life, even so far as to injure his health. Finally, he abandoned poetry and rhetoric for philosophy, and he attached himself to the sect of the Stoics. But he did not neglect the study of law, which was a useful preparation for the high place which he was designed to fill. His teacher was Lucius Volusianus Mycianus, a distinguished jurist. We must suppose that he learned the Roman discipline of arms, which was a necessary part of the education of a man who afterwards led his troops to battle against a warlike race. Antoninus has recorded in his first book the names of his teachers and the obligations which he owed to each of them. The way in which he speaks of what he learned from them might seem to savor of vanity or self-praise if we look carelessly at the way in which he has expressed himself, but if anyone draws this conclusion he will be mistaken. Antoninus means to commemorate the merits of his several teachers, what they taught and what a pupil might learn from them. Besides, this book, like the eleven other books, was for his own use, and if we may trust the note at the end of the first book, it was written during one of Marcus Antoninus's campaigns against the Quadi, at a time when the commemoration of the virtues of his illustrious teachers might remind him of their lessons and the practical uses which he might derive from them. Among his teachers of philosophy was Sextus of Chaeronea, a grandson of Plutarch. What he learned from this excellent man is told by himself. His favorite teacher was Quintus Junius Rusticus, a philosopher and also a man of practical good sense in public affairs. 
Rusticus was the adviser of Antoninus after he became emperor. Young men who are destined for high places are not often fortunate in those who are about them, their companions and teachers. And I do not know any example of a young prince having had an education which can be compared with that of Marcus Antoninus. Such a body of teachers distinguished by their requirements and their character will hardly be collected again. And as to the pupil, we have not had one like him since. Hadrian died in July, A.D. 138, and was succeeded by Antoninus Pius. Marcus Antoninus married Faustina, his cousin, the daughter of Pius, probably about A.D. 146, for he had a daughter born in 147. He received from his adoptive father the title of Caesar, and was associated with him in the administration of the state. The father and the adopted son lived together in perfect friendship and confidence. Antoninus was a dutiful son, and the emperor Pius loved and esteemed him. Antoninus Pius died in March, A.D. 161. The Senate, it is said, urged Marcus Antoninus to take the sole administration of the empire, but he associated with himself the other adopted son of Pius, Lucius Seanius Commodus, who was generally called Lucius Verus. Thus Rome, for the first time, had two emperors. Verus was an indolent man of pleasure and unworthy of his station. Antoninus, however, bore with him, and it is said that Varus had enough sense to pay his colleague the respect due to his character. A virtuous emperor and a loose partner lived together in peace, and their alliance was strengthened by Antoninus giving to Varus for wife his daughter Lucilla. The reign of Antoninus was first troubled by a Parthian war, in which Varus was sent to command, but he did nothing, and the success that was obtained by the Romans in Armenia and on the Euphrates and Tigris was due to his generals. This Parthian war ended in A.D. 165. Aurelius and Verus had a triumph, A.D. 166, for the victories in the east. A pestilence followed, which carried off great numbers in Rome and Italy, and spread to the west of Europe. The north of Italy was also threatened by the rude people beyond the Alps from the borders of Gallia to the eastern side of the Hadriatic. These barbarians attempted to break into Italy, as the Germanic nations had attempted near three hundred years before, and the rest of the life of Antoninus, with some intervals, was employed in driving back the invaders. In 169 Varus suddenly died, and Antoninus administered the state alone. During the German wars, Antoninus resided for three years on the Danube at Carnuntum. The Marcomanni were driven out of Pannonia and almost destroyed in their retreat across the Danube and in A.D. 174 the emperor gained a great victory over the Quadi. In A.D. 175, Avidius Cassius, a brave and skillful Roman commander, who was at the head of the troops in Asia, revolted and declared himself Augustus. But Cassius was assassinated by some of his officers, and so the rebellion came to an end. Antoninus showed his humanity by his treatment of the family and the partisans of Cassius, and his letter to the Senate, in which he recommends mercy, is extant. Antoninus set out for the East, on hearing of Cassius's revolt. Though he appears to have returned to Rome in A.D. 174, he went back to prosecute the war against the Germans, and it is probable that he marched direct to the East from the German war. His wife, Faustina, who accompanied him into Asia, died suddenly at the foot of the Taurus, to the great grief of her husband. Capitolinus, who has written the life of Antoninus, and also Dion Cassius, accused the empress of scandalous infidelity to her husband, and of abominable lewdness. But Capitolinus says that Antoninus either knew it not, or pretended not to know it. Nothing is so common as such malicious reports in all ages, and the history of imperial Rome is full of them. Antoninus loved his wife, and he says that she was obedient, affectionate, and simple. The same scandal had been spread about Faustina's mother, the wife of Antoninus Pius, and yet he too was perfectly satisfied with his wife. Antoninus Pius says after her death in a letter to Fronto that he would rather have lived in exile with his wife than in his palace at Rome without her. There are not many men who would give their wives a better character than these two emperors. Capitolinus wrote in the time of Diocletian, 
He may have intended to tell the truth, but he is a poor, feeble biographer. Dion Cassius, the most malignant of historians, always reports, and perhaps he believed, any scandal against anybody. Antoninus continued his journey to Syria and Egypt, and on his return to Italy through Athens, he was initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries. It was the practice of the emperor to conform to the established rites of the age, and to perform religious ceremonies with due solemnity. We cannot conclude from this that he was a superstitious man, though we might perhaps do so if his book did not show that he was not. But this is only one among many instances that a ruler's public acts do not always prove his real opinions. A prudent governor will not roughly oppose even the superstitions of his people, and though he may wish that they were wiser, he will know that he cannot make them so by offending their prejudices. Antoninus and his son Commodus entered Rome in triumph, perhaps for some German victories, on the 23rd of December, A.D. 176. In the following year, Commodus was associated with his father in the empire, and took the name of Augustus. This year, A.D. 177, is memorable in ecclesiastical history. Attalus and others were put to death at Lyon for their adherence to the Christian religion. The evidence of this persecution is a letter preserved by Eusebius. The letter is from the Christians of Vienna and Lugdunum in Gallia, Vienne and Lyon, to their Christian brethren in Asia and Phrygia, and it is preserved perhaps nearly entire. It contains a very particular description of the tortures inflicted on the Christians in Gallia, and it states that while the persecution was going on, Attalus, a Christian and a Roman citizen, was loudly demanded by the populace and brought into the amphitheater. But the governor ordered him to be reserved with the rest who were in prison, until he had received instructions from the emperor. Many had been tortured before the governor thought of applying to Antoninus. The imperial rescript, says the letter, was that the Christians should be punished, but if they would deny their faith, they must be released. On this, the work began again. The Christians, who were Roman citizens, were beheaded, the rest exposed to the wild beasts in the amphitheater. Some modern writers in ecclesiastical history, when they use this letter, say nothing of the wonderful stories of the martyrs' sufferings. Sanctus, as the letter says, was burnt with plates of hot iron, till his body was one sore, and he had lost all human form, but on being put to the rack, he recovered his former appearance under the torture, which was thus a cure instead of a punishment. He was afterwards torn by beasts, and placed on an iron chair and roasted. He died at last. The letter is one piece of evidence. The writer, whoever he was that wrote in the name of the Gallic Christians, is our evidence both for the ordinary and the extraordinary circumstances of the story, and we cannot accept his evidence for one part and reject the other. We often receive small evidence as a proof of a thing which we believe to be within the limits of probability or possibility, and we reject exactly the same evidence when the thing to which it refers appears very improbable or impossible. But this is a false method of inquiry, though it is followed by some modern writers, who select what they like from a story and reject the rest of the evidence, or if they do not reject it, they dishonestly suppress it. A man can only act consistently by accepting all this letter or rejecting it all, and we cannot blame him for either. But he who rejects it may still admit that such a letter may be founded on real facts, and he would make this admission as the most probable way of accounting for the existence of the letter. But if, as he would suppose, the writer has stated some things falsely, he cannot tell what part of his story is worthy of credit. The war on the northern frontier appears to have been uninterrupted during the visit of Antoninus to the east, and on his return the emperor again left Rome to oppose the barbarians. The Germanic people were defeated in a great battle, A.D. 179. During this campaign, the emperor was seized with some contagious malady, of which he died in the camp at Sirmium, Mitrovitz, on the Sava in Lower Pannonia, but at Vindabana, Vienna, according to other authorities, on the 17th March, A.D. 180, in the 59th year of his age. His son Commodus was with him. The body or the ashes probably of the emperor were carried to Rome, and he received the honor of deification. Those who could afford it had his statue or bust, and when Capitolinus wrote, 
Many people still had statues of Antoninus among the Dea Penates, or household deities. He was in a manner made a saint. Commodus erected to the memory of his father the Antonine Column, which is now in the Piazza Colonna, at Rome. The bas-reliefs, which are placed in a spiral line round the shaft, commemorate the victories of Antoninus over the Marcomanni and the Quadi, and the miraculous shower of rain which refreshed the Roman soldiers and discomfited their enemies. The statue of Antoninus was placed on the capital of the column, but it was removed at some time unknown, and a bronze statue of St. Paul was put in the place by Pope Sixtus V. The historical evidence for the times of Antoninus is very defective, and some of that which remains is not credible. The most curious is the story about the miracle which happened in A.D. 174 during the war with the Quadi. The Roman army was in danger of perishing by thirst, but a sudden storm drenched them with rain, while it discharged fire and hail on their enemies, and the Romans gained a great victory. All the authorities which speak of the battle speak also of the miracle. The Gentile writers assign it to their gods, and the Christians to the intercession of the Christian legion in the emperor's army. To confirm the Christian statement, it is added that the emperor gave the title of thundering to this legion, but Dossier and others who maintain the Christian report of the miracle admit that this title of thundering or lightning was not given to this legion because the Quadi were struck with lightning, but because there was a figure of lightning on their shields, and that this title of the legion existed in the time of Augustus. Scaliger also had observed that the legion was called thundering before the reign of Antoninus. We can learn this from Dion Cassius, who enumerates all the legions of Augustus's time. The name thundering or lightning also occurs on an inscription of the reign of Trajan, which was found at Trieste. Eusebius, when he relates the miracle, quotes Apollinarius, bishop of Hierapolis, as authority for this name being given to the legion Melitini by the emperor, in consequence of the success which he had obtained through their prayers, from which we may estimate the value of Apollinarius's testimony. Eusebius does not say in what book of Apollinarius the statement occurs. Dion says that the thundering legion was stationed in Cappadocia in the time of Augustus. Valacius also observes that in the Notitia of the Imperium Romanum, there is mentioned under the commander of Armenia the prefectura of the Twelfth Legion, named Thundering Melatini, and this position in Armenia will agree with what Dion says of its position in Cappadocia. Accordingly, Valacius concludes that Melatini was not the name of the legion, but of the town in which it was stationed. Melatini was also the name of the district in which this town was situated. The legions did not, he says, take their name from the place where they were on duty, but from the country in which they were raised, and therefore what Eusebius says about the Melatini does not seem probable to him. Yet Valacius, on the authority of Apollinarius and Tertullian, believed that the miracle was worked through the prayers of the Christian soldiers in the emperor's army. Rufinus does not give the name of Melatini to this legion, says Valacius, and probably he purposely omitted it, because he knew that Melatini was the name of a town in Armenia Minor, where the legion was stationed in his time. The emperor, it is said, made a report of his victory to the senate, which we may believe, for such was the practice. But we do not know what he said in his letter, for it is not extant. Dossier assumes that the emperor's letter was purposely destroyed by the senate, or the enemies of Christianity, that so honorable a testimony to the Christians and their religion might not be perpetuated. The critic has, however, not seen that he contradicts when he tells us purport of the letter, for he says that it was destroyed, and even Eusebius could not find it. But there does exist a letter in Greek addressed by Antoninus to the Roman people and the sacred senate after this memorable victory. It is sometimes printed after Justin's first apology, but is totally unconnected with the apologies. This letter is one of the most stupid forgeries of the many which exist, and it cannot be possibly founded even on the genuine report of Antoninus to the Senate. If it were genuine, it would free the emperor from the charge of persecuting men because they were Christians. For he says in this false letter, that if a man accuse another only of being a Christian, and the accused confess and there is nothing else against him, he must be set free. With this monstrous addition, made by a man inconceivably ignorant, that the informer must be burnt alive. During the time of Antoninus Pius and Marcus Antoninus, there appeared the first apology of Justinus, and under Marcus Antoninus the oration of Tatian against the Greeks, 
which was a fierce attack on the established religions. The address of Athenagoras to Marcus Antoninus, on behalf of the Christians, and the apology of Melito, bishop of Sardes, also addressed to the emperor, and that of Apollinarius. The first apology of Justinus is addressed to Titus Antoninus Pius, and his two adopted sons, Marcus Antoninus and Lucius Verus, but we do not know whether they read it. Footnote. Arrhosius says that Justinus the philosopher presented to Antoninus Pius his work in defense of the Christian religion, and made him merciful to the Christians. End footnote. The second apology of Justinus is entitled To the Roman Senate, but this superscription is from some copyist. In the first chapter, Justinus addresses the Romans. In the second chapter, he speaks of an affair that had recently happened in the time of Marcus Antoninus and Lucius Verus, as it seems, and he also directly addresses the emperor, saying of a certain woman, quote, She addressed a petition to thee, the emperor, and thou didst grant the petition, unquote. In other passages, the writer addresses the two emperors, from which we must conclude that the apology was directed to them. Eusebius states that the second apology was addressed to the successor of Antoninus Pius, and he names him Antoninus Verus, meaning Marcus Antoninus. In one passage of the second apology, Justinus, or the writer, whoever he may be, says that even men who followed the Stoic doctrines, when they ordered their lives according to ethical reason, were hated and murdered, such as Heraclitus, Musonius in his own times, and others. For all those who in any way labored to live according to reason, and avoided wickedness, were always hated, and this was the effect of the work of demons. Justinus himself is said to have been put to death at Rome, because he refused to sacrifice to the gods. It cannot have been in the reign of Hadrian, as one authority states, nor in the time of Antoninus Pius, if the second apology was written in the time of Marcus Antoninus. And there was evidence that this event took place under Marcus Antoninus and Lucius Verus, when Rusticus was prefect of the city. The persecution in which Polycarp suffered at Smyrna belongs to the time of Marcus Antoninus. The evidence for it is the letter of the Church of Smyrna to the churches of Philomelium and the other Christian churches, and it is preserved by Eusebius. But the critics do not agree about the time of Polycarp's death, differing in the two extremes to the amount of twelve years. The circumstances of Polycarp's martyrdom were accompanied by miracles, one of which Eusebius has omitted, but it appears in the oldest Latin version of the letter, which Usher published, and it is supposed that this version was made not long after the time of Eusebius. The notice at the end of the letter states that it was transcribed by Caius, from the copy of Irenaeus, the disciple of Polycarp, then transcribed by Socrates at Corinth, quote, after which I, Pioneus, again wrote it out from the copy above mentioned, having searched it out by the revelation of Polycarp, who directed it to me, etc. Unquote. The story of Polycarp's martyrdom is embellished with miraculous circumstances, which some modern writers on ecclesiastical history take the liberty of omitting. Footnote. Conyers Middleton, An Inquiry into the Miraculous Powers, etc., page 126. Middleton says that Eusebius omitted to mention the dove, which flew out of Polycarp's body, and Dodwell and Archbishop Wake have done the same. Wake says, I am so little a friend of such miracles that I thought it better with Eusebius to omit that circumstance than to mention it from Bishop Usher's manuscript, unquote. which manuscript, however, says Middleton, he afterwards declares to be so well attested that we need not any further assurance of the truth of it. End footnote. In order to form a proper notion of the condition of the Christians under Marcus Antoninus, we must go back to Trajan's time. When the younger Pliny was governor of Bithynia, the Christians were numerous in those parts, and the worshippers of the old religion were falling off. The temples were deserted, the festivals neglected, and there were no purchasers of victims for sacrifice. Those who were interested in the maintenance of the old religion thus found that their prophets were in danger. Christians of both sexes, and of all ages, were brought before the governor, who did not know what to do with them. He could come to no other conclusion than this, that those who confessed to be Christians, and persevered in their religion, ought to be punished, if for nothing else, for their invincible obstinacy. He found no crimes proved against the Christians, and he could only characterize their religion as a depraved and extravagant superstition, which might be stopped if the people were allowed the opportunity of recanting. 
Pliny wrote this in a letter to Trajan. Footnote. The Martyrium Ignatii, first published in Latin by Archbishop Usher, is the chief evidence for the circumstances of Ignatius's death. In footnote. In the time of Hadrian, it was no longer possible for the Roman government to overlook the great increase of the Christians in the hostility of the common sort to them. If the governors in the provinces were willing to let them alone, they could not resist the fanaticism of the heathen community, who looked on the Christians as atheists. The Jews, too, who were settled all over the Roman Empire, were as hostile to the Christians as the Gentiles were. Footnote. We have the evidence of Justinus to this effect. Quote, the Christians are attacked by the Jews as if they were men of a different race, and are persecuted by the Greeks, and those who hate them cannot give the reason of their enmity. Unquote. End footnote. With the time of Hadrian began the Christian apologies, which show plainly what the popular feeling towards the Christians then was. A rescript of Hadrian to Minucius Fundanus, the proconsul of Asia, which stands at the end of Justin's first apology, instructs the governor that innocent people must not be troubled, and false accusers must not be allowed to extort money from them. The charges against the Christians must be made in due form, and no attention must be paid to popular clamors, when Christians were regularly prosecuted and convicted of illegal acts, they must be punished according to their deserts, and false accusers also must be punished. Footnote. And in Eusebius, Erosius says that Hadrian sent this rescript to Minucius Fundanus, proconsul of Asia, after being instructed in books written on the Christian religion by Quadratus, a disciple of the apostles, and Aristides, an Athenian, an honest and wise man, and Serenus Grinius. In the Greek text of Hadrian's rescript, there is mentioned Serenius Grinianus, the predecessor of Minucius Vandanus, in the government of Asia. This rescript of Hadrian has clearly been added to the apology by some editor. In footnote. Antonius Pius is said to have published rescripts to the same effect. The terms of Hadrian's rescript seem very favorable to the Christians, but if we understand it in this sense, that they are only to be punished like other people for illegal acts, it would have no meaning, for that could have been done without asking the emperor's advice. The real purpose of the rescript is that Christians must be punished if they persisted in their belief, and would not prove their renunciation of it by acknowledging the heathen religion. This was Trajan's rule, and we have no reason for supposing that Hadrian granted more to the Christians than Trajan did. There is also printed at the end of Justin's first apology a rescript of Antoninus Pius to the commune of Asia, and it is also in Eusebius. The date of the rescript is the third consulship of Antoninus Pius. The rescript declares that the Christians, for they are meant, though the name Christians does not occur in the rescript, were not to be disturbed unless they were attempting something against the Roman rule, and no man was to be punished simply for being a Christian. But this rescript is spurious. Any man moderately acquainted with Roman history will see by the style and tenor that it is a clumsy forgery. In the time of Marcus Antoninus, the opposition between the old and the new belief was still stronger, and the adherents of the heathen religion urged those in authority to a more regular resistance to the invasions of the Christian faith. Melito, in his apology to Marcus Antoninus, represents the Christians of Asia as persecuted under new imperial orders. Shameless informers, he says, men who were greedy after the property of others, used these orders as a means of robbing those who were doing no harm. He doubts if a just emperor could have ordered anything so unjust, and if the last order was really not from the emperor, the Christians entreat him not to give them up to their enemies. We conclude from this that there were at least imperial rescripts, or constitutions of Marcus Antoninus, which were made the foundations of these persecutions. The fact of being a Christian was now a crime and punished, unless the accused denied their religion. Then come the persecutions at Smyrna, which some modern critics place in A.D. 167, ten years before the persecution of Leon. The governors of the provinces under Marcus Antoninus might have found enough even in Trajan's rescript to warrant them in punishing Christians, and the fanaticism of the people would drive them to persecution, even if they were unwilling. But besides the fact of the Christians rejecting all the heathen ceremonies, we must not forget that they plainly maintained that all the heathen religions were false. The Christians thus declared war against the heathen rites, and it is hardly necessary to observe 
that this was a declaration of hostility against the Roman government, which tolerated all the various forms of superstition that existed in the empire, and could not consistently tolerate another religion, which declared that all the rest were false, and all the splendid ceremonies of the empire only a worship of devils. If we had a true ecclesiastical history, we should know how the Roman empires attempted to check the new religion, how they enforced their principle of finally punishing Christians, simply as Christians, which Justin in his apology affirms that they did, and I have no doubt that he tells the truth, how far popular clamor and riots went in this matter, and how far many fanatical and ignorant Christians, for there were many such, contributed to excite the fanaticism on the other side, and to embitter the quarrel between the Roman government and the new religion. Our extant ecclesiastical histories are manifestly falsified, and what truth they contain is grossly exaggerated. But the fact is certain that in the time of Marcus Antoninus, the heathen populations were in open hostility to the Christians, and that under Antoninus's rule, men were put to death because they were Christians. Eusebius, in the preface to his fifth book, remarks that in the seventeenth year of Antoninus's reign, in some parts of the world the persecution of the Christians became more violent, and that it proceeded from the populace in the cities. And he adds, in his usual style of exaggeration, that we may infer from what took place in a single nation that myriads of martyrs were made in the habitable earth. The nation which he alludes to is Gallia, and he then proceeds to give the letter to the churches of Vienna and Lugdunum. It is probable that he has assigned the true cause of the persecutions, the fanaticism of the populace, and that both governors and emperor had a great deal of trouble with these disturbances. How far Marcus was cognizant of these cruel proceedings we do not know, for the historical records of his reign are very defective. He did not make the rule against the Christians, for Trajan did that, and if we admit that he would have been willing to let the Christians alone, we cannot affirm that he was in his power, for it would be a great mistake to suppose that Antoninus had the unlimited authority, which some modern sovereigns have had. His power was limited by certain constitutional forms, by the Senate, and by the precedents of his predecessors. We cannot admit that such a man was an active persecutor, for there is no evidence that he was, though it is certain that he had no good opinion of the Christians, as appears from his own words. Footnote. Except that of Erosius, who says that during the Parthian War, there were grievous persecutions of the Christians in Asia and Gallia, under the orders of Marcus, Praecepto Aius, and, quote, many were crowned with the martyrdom of saints, unquote. End footnote. But he knew nothing of them except their hostility to the Roman religion, and he probably thought that they were dangerous to the state, notwithstanding the professions false or true of some of the apologists. So much I have said, because it would be unfair not to state all that can be urged against a man whom his contemporaries in subsequent ages venerated as a model of virtue and benevolence. If I admitted the genuineness of some documents, he would be altogether clear from the charge of even allowing any persecutions. But as I seek the truth, and am sure that they are false, I leave him to bear whatever blame is his due. Footnote. Dr. F. C. Bauer, in his work entitled Das Christentum und die Christliche Kirche der drei ersten Jahrhunderte, etc., has examined this question with great good sense and fairness, and I believe he has stated the truth as near as our authorities enable us to reach it. End footnote. I add that it is quite certain that Antoninus did not derive any of his ethical principles from a religion of which he knew nothing. Footnote. In the Digest, there is the following excerpt from Modus Tinus. Quote, Si cuis aliquid fecerit, quo levis hominum anima, separstitiona naminus terrerenter. Divus Marcus hu yasmada hominas, in insulam relegara rescripsit. Unquote. There is no doubt that the emperor's reflections, or his meditations, as they are generally named, is a genuine work. In the first book he speaks of himself, his family, and his teachers, and in other books he mentions himself. Soedus notices a work of Antoninus in twelve books, which he names the conduct of his own life, and he cites the book under several words in his dictionary, giving the emperor's name, but not the title of the work. There are also passages cited by Suidas from Antoninus without mention of the emperor's name. The true title of the work is unknown. 
Zeilander, who published the first edition of this book with a Latin version, used a manuscript, which contained the twelve books, but it is not known where the manuscript is now. The only other complete manuscript which is known to exist is in the Vatican Library, but it has no titles and no inscriptions of the several books. The eleventh only has the inscription marked with an asterisk. The other Vatican manuscripts in the three Florentine contain only excerpts from the Emperor's book. All the titles of the excerpts nearly agree with that which Silander prefixed to his edition. This title has been used by all subsequent editors. We cannot tell whether Antoninus divided his work into books or somebody else did it. If the inscriptions at the end of the first and second books are genuine, he may have made the division himself. It is plain that the emperor wrote down his thoughts or reflections as the occasions arose, and since they were intended for his own use, it is no improbable conjecture that he left a complete copy behind him, written with his own hand, for it is not likely that so diligent a man would use the labor of a transcriber for such a purpose, and expose his most secret thoughts to any other eye. He may have also intended the book for his son Eusebius Commodus, who, however, had no taste for his father's philosophy. Some careful hand preserved the precious volume, and a work by Antoninus is mentioned by other late writers besides Suidas. Many critics have labored on the text of Antoninus. The most complete edition is that by Thomas Gattaker, 1652, Quarto. The second edition of Gattaker was superintended by George Stanhope, 1697, Quarto. There is also an edition of 1704. Gattaker made and suggested many good corrections, and he also made a new Latin version, which is not a very good specimen of Latin, but it generally expresses the sense of the original, and often better than some of the more recent translations. He added in the margin opposite to each paragraph references to the other parallel passages, and he wrote a commentary, one of the most complete that has been written on any ancient author. This commentary contains the editor's exposition of the more difficult passages, and quotations from all the Greek and Roman writers for the illustration of the text. It is a wonderful monument of learning and labor, and certainly no Englishman has yet done anything like it. At the end of his preface, the editor says that he wrote it at Rotherhith, near London in a severe winter, when he was in the seventy-eighth year of his age, 1651, a time when Milton, Selden, and other great men of the Commonwealth time were living, and the great French scholar Somas, Salmatius, with whom Gattaker corresponded and received help from him for his edition of Antoninus. The Greek text has also been edited by J. M. Schultz, Leipzig, 1802, eight volumes, and by the learned Greek Athomontinus Corre, Paris, 1816, eight volumes. The text of Schultz was republished by Tauchnitz, 1821. There are English, German, French, Italian, and Spanish translations of Marcus Antoninus, and there may be others. I have not seen all the English translations. There is one by Jeremy Collier, 1702, eight volumes, a most coarse and vulgar copy of the original. The latest French translation by Alexis Pierron, in the collection of Charpentier, is better than Dossier's, which has been honored with an Italian version, Udine, 1772. There is an Italian version, 1675, which I have not seen. It is by a cardinal. Quote, a man illustrious in the church, the Cardinal Francis Barberini the Elder, nephew of Pope Urban the Seventh, occupied the last years of his life in translating into his native language the thoughts of the Roman Emperor, in order to diffuse among the faithful the fertilizing and vivifying seeds. He dedicated this translation to his soul, to make it, as he says in his energetic style, redder than his purple at the sight of the virtues of this Gentile." Unquote. I have made this translation at intervals after having used the book for many years. It is made from the Greek, but I have not always followed one text, and I have occasionally compared other versions with my own. I made this translation for my own use, because I found that it was worth the labor, but it may be useful to others also, and therefore I determined to print it. As the original is sometimes very difficult to understand, and still more difficult to translate, it is not possible that I have always avoided error. But I believe that I have not often missed the meaning, and those who will take the trouble to compare the translation with the original should not hastily conclude that I am wrong, if they do not agree with me. Some passages do give the meaning, 
though at first sight they may not appear to do so, and when I differ from the translators, I think in some places they are wrong, and in other places I am sure that they are. I have placed in some passages a plus sign, which indicates corruption in the text or great uncertainty in the meaning. I could have made the language more easy and flowing, but I have preferred a ruder style as being better suited to express the character of the original, and sometimes the obscurity which may appear in the version is a fair copy of the obscurity of the Greek. If I have not given the best words for the Greek, I have done the best that I could, and in the next text I have always given the same translation of the same word. The last reflection of the Stoic philosophy that I have observed is in Simplicius's Commentary of the Enchiridion of Epictetus. Simplicius was not a Christian, and such a man was not likely to be converted at a time when Christianity was grossly corrupted. But he was a really religious man, and he includes his commentary with a prayer to the deity, which no Christian could improve. From the time of Zeno to Simplicius, a period of about nine hundred years, the Stoic philosophy formed the characters of some of the best and greatest men. Finally it became extinct, and we hear no more of it till the revival of letters in Italy. Angelo Poliziano met with two very inaccurate and incomplete manuscripts of Epictetus's Enchiridion, which he translated into Latin and dedicated to his great patron Lorenzo de' Medici, in whose collection he had found the book. Poliziano's version was printed in the first Baal edition of the Enchiridion, A.D. 1531, Abed Andream Cartandrum. Poliziano recommends the Enchiridion to Lorenzo as a work well suited to his temper, and useful in the difficulties by which he was surrounded. Epictetus and Antoninus have had readers ever since they were printed. The little book of Antoninus has been the companion of some great men. Machiavelli's Art of War and Marcus Antoninus were the two books which were used when he was a young man by Captain John Smith, and he could not have found two writers better fitted to form the character of a soldier and a man. Smith is almost unknown and forgotten in England, his native country, but not in America, where he saved the young colony of Virginia. He was great in his heroic mind and his deeds in arms, but greater still in the nobleness of his character. For a man's greatness lies not in wealth and station, as the vulgar believe, nor yet in his intellectual capacity, which is often associated with the meanest moral character, the most abject servility to those in high places, and arrogance to the poor and lowly. But a man's true greatness lies in the consciousness of an honest purpose in life, founded on a just estimate of himself and everything else, on frequent self-examination, and a steady obedience to the rule which he knows to be right, without troubling himself, as the emperor says he should not, about what others may think or say, or whether they do or do not do that which he thinks and says and does. End of chapter 13「The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius」Section 14 The Philosophy of Antoninus by George Long, M.A. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, June 2007 The Philosophy of Antoninus by George Long, M.A. It has been said that Stoic philosophy first showed its real value when it passed from Greece to Rome. The doctrines of Zeno and his successors were well suited to the gravity and practical good sense of the Romans, and even in the Republican period we have an example of a man, M. Cato Utensis, who lived the life of a Stoic and died consistently with the opinions which he professed. He was a man, says Cicero, who embraced the Stoic philosophy from conviction, not for the purpose of vain discussion as most did but in order to make his life conformable to the Stoic precepts. In the wretched time from the death of Augustus to the murder of Domitian, there was nothing but Stoic philosophy which could console and support the followers of the old religion under imperial tyranny and amidst universal corruption. There were even then noble minds that could dare and endure, sustained by good conscious and elevated idea of the purposes of man's existence. Such were Paetus Thasia, Helvidius Priscius, 
Cornutus C. Musonius Rufus, and the poets Perseus and Juvenal, whose energetic language and manly thoughts may be as instructive to us now as they might have been to their contemporaries. Perseus died under Nero's bloody reign, but Juvenal had the good fortune to survive the tyrant Domitian, and to see the better times of Nerva, Trajan, and Hadrian. His best precepts are derived from the Stoic school, and they are enforced in his finest verses by the unrivaled vigor of the Latin language. The two best expounders of the later Stoical philosophy were a Greek slave and a Roman emperor. Epictetus, a Phrygian Greek, was brought to Rome, we know not how, but he was there the slave and afterwards the freedman of an unworthy master, Epaphroditus by name, himself a freeman, and a favorite of Nero. Epictetus may have been a hearer of C. Musonius Rufus while he was still a slave, but he could hardly have been a teacher before he was made free. He was one of the philosophers whom Domitian's order banished from Rome. He retired to Nicopolis in Epirus, and he may have died there. Like other great teachers, he wrote nothing, and we are indebted to his grateful pupil Arian for what we have of Epictetus's discourses. Arian wrote eight books of the discourses of Epictetus, of which only four remain and some fragments. We also have from Arian's hand the small Enchiridion, or manual, or the chief precepts of Epictetus. There is a valuable commentary on the Enchiridion by Simplicis, who lived at the time of the Emperor Justinian. Antoninus, in his first book, in which he gratefully commentaries his obligations to his teachers, says that he was made acquainted by Junius Rusticus with the discourses of Epictetus, whom he mentions also in other passages. Indeed, the doctrines of Epictetus and Antoninus are the same, and Epictetus is the best authority for the explanation of the philosophical language of Antoninus and the exposition of his opinions. But the method of the two philosophers is entirely different. Epictetus addressed himself to his hearers in a continuous discourse and in a familial and simple manner. Antoninus wrote down his reflections for his own use only, in short, unconnected paragraphs, which are often obscure. The Stoics made three divisions of philosophy, physic, ethic, and logic. This division, we are told by Diogenes, was made by Zeno of Sidium, the founder of the Stoic sect, and by Chrysippus. But these philosophers placed the three divisions in the following order, logic, physic, ethic. It appears, however, that this division was made before Zeno's time and acknowledged by Plato, as Cicero remarks. Logic is not synonymous with our term logic in the narrow sense of that word. Cleanthes, a Stoic, subdivided the three divisions and made six, dialectic and rhetoric, comprised in logic, ethic and politic, physic and theology. This division was merely for practical use, for all philosophy is one. Even among the earliest Stoics, logic or dialectic does not occupy the same place as in Plato. It is considered only as an instrument which is to be used for the other divisions of philosophy. An exposition of the earlier Stoic doctrines and of their modifications would require a volume. My object is to explain only the opinions of Antoninus, so far as they can be collected from his book. According to the subdivision of Cleanthes, physic and theology go together, or the study of the nature of things and the study of the nature of the deity, so far as man can understand the deity, and of his government of the universe. This division or subdivision is not formally adopted by Antoninus, for, as already observed, there is no method in his book, but it is virtually contained in it. Cleanthes also connects ethic and politic, or the study of principles of morals, and the study of the constitution of civil society, and undoubtedly he did well in subdividing ethic into two parts, ethic in a narrower sense, and politic, for though the two are intimately connected, they are also very distinct, and many questions can only be properly discussed by carefully observing the distinction. Antoninus does not treat of politic, his subject is ethic an ethic in its practical application to his own conduct in life as a man and as a governor. His ethic is founded on the doctrines about man's nature, the universal nature, and the relations of every man to everything else. It is therefore intimately and inseparably connected with physics or the nature of things, and with theology or the nature of the deity. He advises us to examine well all the impressions on our minds and to form a right judgment of them to make just conclusions, and to inquire into the meanings of words, and so far to apply dialectic, but he has no attempt at any exposition of dialectic, and his philosophy is in substance purely moral and practical. 
He says, quote, constantly, and, if it be possible, on the occasion of every impression on the soul, apply it to the principles of physic, of ethic, and of dialectic, end quote. Which is only another way of telling us to examine the impression in every possible way. In another passage, he says, quote, to the age which have been mentioned, let this one still be added. Make for thyself a definition or description of the object, which is presented to thee so as to see distinctly what kind of a thing it is in its substance, in its nudity, in its complete entirety, and tell thyself its proper name and the names of the things which it has been compounded and into which it will be resolved. End quote. Such an examination implies a use of dialectic, which Antoninus accordingly employed as a mean towards establishing his physical, theological, and ethical principles. There are several expositions of the physical, theological, and ethical principles which are contained in the work of Antoninus, and more expositions than I have read. Ritter, after explaining the doctrines of Epictetus, treats very briefly and insufficiently those of Antoninus, but he refers to a short essay in which the work is done better. There is also an essay on the philosophical principles of M. Aurelius Antoninus by J. M. Schultz, placed at the end of his German translation of Antoninus. With the assistance of these two useful essays and his own diligent study, a man may form a sufficient notion of the principles of Antoninus, but he will find it more difficult to expound them to others. Besides the want of arrangement in the original and of connection among the numerous paragraphs, the corruption of the text, the obscurity of the language and the style, and sometimes perhaps the confusion in the writer's own ideas, besides all this there is occasionally an apparent contradiction in the emperor's thoughts, as if his principles were sometimes unsettled, as if doubt sometimes clouded his mind. A man who leads a life of tranquility and reflection, who is not disturbed at home, and meddles not with the affairs of the world, may keep his mind at ease and his thoughts in one even course. But such a man has not been tried. All his ethical philosophy and his passive virtue might turn out to be idle words if he were once exposed to the rude realities of human existence. Fine thoughts and moral dissertations from men who have not worked and suffered may be read, but they will be forgotten. No religion, no ethical philosophy is worth anything if the teacher has not lived the quote, life of an apostle, end quote, and has been ready to die, quote, the death of a martyr, end quote. Quote, not in passivity, the passive affects, but in activity lie the evil and the good of the rational social animal, just as his virtue and his vice lie not in passivity, but in activity, end quote. Section 9, paragraph 16. The emperor Antoninus was a practical moralist. From his youth, he followed a laborious discipline, and though his high station placed him above all want or the fear of it, he lived as frugally and as temperately as the poorest philosopher. Epictetus wanted little, and it seems that he always had the little that he wanted, and he was content with it, as he had been with his servile station. But Antoninus, after his accession to the empire, sat on an uneasy seat. He had the administration of an empire which extended from the Euphrates to the Atlantic, from the cold mountains of Scotland to the hot sands of Africa, and we may imagine, though we cannot know it by experience, what must be the trials, the troubles, the anxiety, and the sorrows of him who has the world's business on his hands with the wish to do the best he can, and the certain knowledge that he can do very little of the good which he wishes. In the midst of war, pestilence, conspiracy, general corruption, and with the weight of so unwieldy an empire upon him, we may easily comprehend that Antoninus often had need of all his fortitude to support him. The best and bravest men have moments of doubt and of weakness, but if they are the best and the bravest, they rise again from their depression by recurring to first principles, as Antoninus does. The emperor says that life is smoke, a vapor, and St. James in his epistle is of the same mind, that the world is full of envious, jealous, malignant people, and a man might well be content to get out of it. He has doubts, perhaps, sometimes even about that to which he holds most firmly. There are only a few passages of this kind, but they are the evidence of struggles which even the noblest of the sons of men had to maintain against the hard realities of his daily life. A poor remark it is, which I have seen somewhere, and made in a disparaging way, that the emperor's reflections show that he had need of consolation and comfort in life, and even to prepare him to meet his death. True, that he did need comfort and support, and we see how he found it. 
he constantly recurs to his fundamental principle that the universe is wisely ordered, that every man is a part of it and must conform to that order which he cannot change, that whatever the deity has done is good, that all mankind are a man's brethren, that he must love and cherish them and try to make them better, even those who would do him harm. This is his conclusion. Quote, what then is that which is able to conduct a man? One thing and only one, philosophy. But this consists in keeping the divinity within a man free from violence and unharmed, superior to pains and pleasures, doing nothing without a purpose nor yet falsely and with hypocrisy, not feeling the need of another man's doing or not doing anything, and besides accepting all that happens and all that is allotted as coming from thence wherever it is, from whence he himself came, and finally waiting for death with a cheerful mind as being nothing else than a dissolution of the elements of which every living being is compounded. But if there is no harm to the elements themselves in each continually changing into another, why should the man have any apprehension about the change and dissolution of all the elements himself? For it is according to nature, and nothing is evil that is according to nature. End quote. The physic of Antoninus is the knowledge of the nature of the universe, of its government, and of the relation of man's nature to both. He names the universe, quote, the universal substance, end quote, and he adds that, quote, reason, end quote, covers the universe. He also uses the term, quote, universal nature, end quote, or, quote, nature of the universe, end quote. He calls the universe, quote, the one and all, which we name cosmos or order, end quote. If he ever seems to use these general terms as significant of the all, of all that man can in any way conceive to exist, he still on other occasion plainly distinguishes between matter, material things, and cause, origin, reason. This is conformable to Zeno's doctrine that there are two original principles of all things, that which acts and that which is acted upon. That which is acted on is the formless matter, that which acts is the reason, God, who is eternal and operates through all matter and produces all things. So Antoninus speaks of the reason which pervades all substance and through all time by fixed periods, parentheses, revolutions, and parentheses, administers the universe. God is eternal and matter is eternal. It is God who gives form to matter, but he is not said to have created matter. According to this view, which is as old as Anaxagoras, God and matter exist independently, but God governs matter. This doctrine is simply the expression of the fact of the existence both of matter and of God. The Stoics did not perplex themselves with the insoluble question of the origin and nature of matter. Antoninus also assumes a beginning of things, as we now know them, but his language is sometimes very obscure. I have endeavored to explain the meaning of one difficult passage. Matter consists of elemental parts of which all material objects are made but nothing is permanent in form. The nature of the universe, according to Antoninus' expression, quote, loves nothing so much as to change the things which are, and to make new things like them. For everything that exists is in a manner the seed of that which will be. But thou art thinking only of seeds which are cast into the earth or into a womb. But this is a very vulgar notion, end quote. All things, then, are in a constant flux and change, some things are dissolved into the elements, others come in their places, and so, quote, the whole universe continues ever young and perfect, end quote. Antoninus has some obscure expressions about what he calls, quote, seminal principles, end quote. He opposes these to the Epicurean atoms, and consequently, quote, his seminal principles, end quote, are not material atoms which wander about at hazard and combine nobody knows how. In one passage he speaks of living principles, souls after the dissolution of their bodies being received into the, quote, seminal principle of the universe, end quote. Schultz thinks that by, quote, seminal principles, Antoninus means the relation of the various elemental principles, which relations are determined by the deity and by which alone the production of organized beings is possible, end quote. This may be the meaning, but if it is, nothing of any value can be derived from it. Antoninus often uses the word, quote, nature, end quote, and we must attempt to fix its meaning. The simple etymological sense is, quote, production, end quote, the birth of what we call things. 
the Romans used natura, which also means birth originally. But neither the Greeks nor Romans stuck to this simple meaning, nor do we. Antoninus says, quote, Whether the universe is a concourse of atoms or nature is a system, let this first be established, that I am part of the whole which is governed by nature. End quote. Here it might seem as if nature were personified and viewed as an active, efficient power, as something which, if not independent of the deity, acts by a power which is given to it by the deity. Such, if I understand the expression right, is the way in which the word nature is often used now, though it is plain that many writers use the word without fixing any exact meaning to it. It is the same with the expression laws of nature, which some writers may use in an intelligible sense, but others as clearly use in no definite sense at all. There is no meaning in this word nature except that which Bishop Butler assigns to it when he says, quote, the only distinct meaning of that word natural is stated, fixed, or settled, since what is natural as much requires and presupposes an intelligent agent to render it so, i.e. to effect it continually or at stated times as what is supernatural or miraculous does to effect it at once." End quote. This is Plato's meaning when he says that God holds the beginning and end and middle of all that exists and proceeds straight on his course, making his circuit according to nature. Parens, that is by fixed order and parens, and he is continually accompanied by justice who punishes those who deviate from the divine law that is from the order or course which God observes when we look at the motion of the planets the action of what we call gravitation the elemental combination of unorganized bodies and their resolution the production of plants and of living bodies their generation growth and their dissolution which we call their death we observe a regular sequence of phenomena, which, within the limits of experience present and past, so far as we know the past, is fixed and invariable. But if this is not so, if the order and sequence of phenomena as known to us are subject to change in the course of an infinite progression, and such change is conceivable, we have nor discovered, not shall we ever discover, the whole of the order and sequence of phenomena, in which sequence there may be involved according to its very nature that is, according to its fixed order, some variation of which we now call order or the nature of things. It is also conceivable that such changes have taken place, changes in the order of things, as we are compelled by the imperfection of language to call them, which are no changes. And further, it is certain that our knowledge of the true sequence of all actual phenomena, as for instance, the phenomena of generation, growth and dissolution, is and ever must be imperfect. We do not fare much better when we speak of causes and effects than when we speak of nature. For the practical purposes of life, we may use the terms cause and effect conveniently, and we may fix a distinct meaning to them, distinct enough at least to prevent all misunderstanding. But the case is different when we speak of causes and effects as of things. All that we know is that phenomena, as the Greeks called them, or appearances which follow one another in a regular order as we conceive it, so that if some one phenomenon should fail in the series, we conceive that there must either be an interruption of the series, or that something else will appear after the phenomenon which has failed to appear, and will occupy the vacant place, and so the series and its progression may be modified or totally changed. Cause and effect then mean nothing in a sequence of natural phenomena beyond what I have said, and the real cause, or the transcendent cause, as some would call it, of each successive phenomena is in that which is the cause of all things which are, which have been, and which will be forever. Thus the word creation may have a real sense if we consider it as the first, if we can conceive a first in the present order of natural phenomena. But in the vulgar sense of creation of all things at a certain time, followed by a quiescence of the first cause and an abandonment of all sequences and phenomena to the laws of nature, or to the other words that people may use, is absolutely absurd. Now, though there is great difficulty in understanding all the passages of Antoninus in which he speaks of nature, of the changes of things, and of the economy of the universe, I am convinced that his sense of nature and natural is the same as that which I have stated. And as he was a man who knew how to use words in a clear way and with a strict consistency, we ought to assume, even if his meaning in some passages is doubtful, that his view of nature was in harmony with his fixed belief in the all-pervading, ever-present, and ever-active energy of God. There is much in Antoninus that is hard to understand, and it might be said that he did not fully comprehend all that he wrote, which would, however, be in no way remarkable, for it happens now that a man may write what neither he nor anybody can understand, 
Antoninus tells us to look at things and see what they are, resolving them into the material, the causal, and the relation, or the purpose by which he seems to mean something in nature of what we call effect or end. The word cause is the difficulty. There is the same word in the Sanskrit, and the subtle philosophers of India and of Greece and the less subtle philosophers of modern times have all used this word or an equivalent word in a vague way. Yet the confusion sometimes may be the inevitable ambiguity of language rather than in the mind of the writer, for I cannot think that some of the wisest of men did not know what they intended to say. When Antoninus says that, quote, everything that exists is in a manner the seed of that which will be, end quote, he might be supposed to say what some of the Indian philosophers have said, and thus a profound truth might be converted into a gross absurdity. But he says, quote, in a manner, end quote. And in a manner he said true, and in another manner, if you mistake his meaning, he said false. When Plato said, quote, nothing ever is, but is always becoming, end quote, he delivered a text out of which we may derive something, for he destroys by it not all practical, but all speculative notions of cause and effect. The whole series of things as they appear to us must be contemplated in time, that is, in succession, and we conceive or suppose intervals between one state of things and another state of things, so that there is priority and sequence, and interval, and being, and a ceasing to be, and beginning and ending. But there is nothing of this kind in the nature of things. It is an everlasting continuity. When Antoninus speaks of generation, he speaks of one cause acting, and then another cause taking up the work, which the former left in a certain state, and so on. And we might conceive that he had some notion like what has been called, quote, the self-evolving power of nature, end quote. A fine phrase indeed, the full import of which I believe that the writer of it did not see, and thus he laid himself open to the imputation of being a follower of one of the Hindu sects, which makes all things come by evolution out of nature or matter, or out of something which takes the place of the deity, but is not deity. I would have all men think as they please, or as they can, and I only claim the same freedom which I give. When a man writes anything, we may fairly try to find out all that his words must mean, even if the result is that they mean what he did not mean, and if we find this contradiction, it is not our fault, but his misfortune. Now Antoninus is perhaps somewhat in the condition in what he says, though he speaks at the end of the paragraph of the power which acts unseen by the eyes, but still no less clearly. But whether in this passage he means the power is conceived to be in different successive causes, or in something else, nobody can tell. From other passages, however, I do collect that his notion of the phenomena of the universe is what I have stated. The deity works unseen, if we may use such language, and perhaps I may, as Job did, or he wrote the book of Job. Quote, in him we live and move and are, end quote, said St. Paul to the Athenians, and to show his bearers that this was no new doctrine, he quoted the Greek poets. One of these poets was the Stoic Cleanthes, whose noble hymn to Zeus or God is an elevated expression of devotion and philosophy. It deprives nature of her power and puts her under the immediate government of the deity. Quote, Thee all this heaven which whirls around the earth, obeys and willing follows where thou leadest. Without thee, God, nothing is done on earth, nor in the ethereal realms, nor in the sea, save what the wicked through their folly do. End quote. Antony's conviction of the existence of a divine power and government was founded on his perception of the order of the universe. Like Socrates, he says that though we cannot see the form of divine powers, we know that they exist because we see their works. Quote, to those who ask, where hast thou seen the gods, or how dost thou comprehend that they exist and so worship with them? I answer in the first place, that they may be seen even with the eyes. In the second place, neither have I seen my own soul, and yet I honor it. Thus then, with respect to the gods, from what I constantly experience of their power, from this I comprehend that they exist, and I venerate them. End quote. This is a very old argument, which has always had great weight with most people, and has appeared sufficient. It does not acquire the least additional strength by being developed in a learned treatise. It is as intelligible and its simple enunciation as it can be made. If it is rejected, there is no arguing with him who rejects it. And if it is worked out into innumerable particulars, the value of the evidence runs the risk of being buried under a mass of words. Man being conscious that he has a spiritual power or intellectual power, or that he has such a power, in whatever way he conceives that he has it, for I wish simply to state a fact, from this power which he has in himself he is led, as Antoninus says, to believe that there is a greater power, which, as the old Stoics tell us, 
pervades the whole universe as the intellect pervades man. God exists, then, but what do we know of his nature? Antoninus says that the soul of man is an efflux from the divinity. We have bodies like animals, but we have reason, intelligence as the gods. Animals have life, and what we call instincts are natural principles of action, but the rational animal man alone has rational intelligent soul. Antoninus insists on this continually. God is in man, and so we must constantly attend to the divinity within us, for it is only in this way that we can have any knowledge of the nature of God. The human soul is in a sense a portion of the divinity, and the soul alone has any communication with the deity, for, as he says, quote, with his intellectual part alone God touches the intelligence only which has flowed and has been derived from himself into these bodies, End quote. In fact, he says that which is hidden within a man is life, that is, the man himself. All the rest is vesture, covering organs, instrument which the living man, the real man, uses for purposes of his present existence. The air is universally diffused for him who is able to respire, and so for him who is willing to partake of it, the intelligent power which holds within it all things is diffused as wide and as free as the air. It is by living a divine life that man approaches to a knowledge of the divinity. It is by following the divinity within, as Antoninus calls it, that man comes nearest to the deity, the supreme good, for a man can never attain to perfect agreement with his internal guide. Quote, live with the gods. And he does live with the gods who constantly shows them that his own soul is satisfied with that which is assigned to him, and that it does all the demon wishes which Zeus hath given to every man for his guardian and guide a portion of himself. And this demon is every man's understanding and reason. End quote. There is in man, that is in the reason, the intelligence, a superior faculty which if exercised rules all the rest. This is the ruling faculty which Cicero renders by the Latin word principatus, quote, to which nothing can or ought to be superior, end quote. Antoninus often uses this term in others which are equivalent. He names it, quote, the governing intelligence, end quote. The governing faculty is the master of the soul. A man must reverence only his ruling faculty and the divinity within him. As we must reverence that which is supreme in the universe, so we must reverence that which is supreme in ourselves, and this is that which of the like kind with that which is the supreme in the universe. So, as Plotinus says, the soul of man can only know the divine so far as it knows itself. In one passage, Antoninus speaks of a man's condemnation of himself, when the diviner part within him has been overpowered and yields to the less honorable and to the perishable part the body and its gross pleasures. In a word, the views of Antoninus on this matter, however, his expressions may vary, are exactly what Bishop Butler expresses when he speaks of, quote, the natural supremacy of the reflection or conscious, end quote, of the faculty, quote, which surveys, approves, or disapproves the several affectations of our mind and actions of our lives, end quote. Much matter might be collected from Antoninus on the notion of the universe being one animated being, but all that he says amounts to no more as Schultz remarks than this, the soul of man is most intimately united to his body, and together they make one animal which we call man. So the deity is most intimately united to the world or the material universe, and together they form one whole. But Antoninus did not view God and the material universe as the same any more than he viewed the body and soul of man as one. Antoninus has no speculations on the absolute nature of the deity. It was not his fashion to waste his time on what a man cannot understand. He was satisfied that God exists, that he governs all things, that man can only have an imperfect knowledge of his nature, and he must attain this imperfect knowledge by reverencing the divinity which is within him and keeping it pure. From all that has been said, it follows that the universe is administered by the providence of God, and that all things are wisely ordered. There are passages in which Antoninus expresses doubts or states different possible theories of the constitution and government of the universe, but he always recurs to his fundamental principle, that if we admit the existence of a deity, we must also admit that he orders all things wisely and well. Epictetus says that we can discern the providence which rules the world if we possess two things, the power of seeing all that happens with respect to each thing, and a grateful disposition. But if all things are wisely ordered, how is the world so full of what we call evil, physical and moral? If instead of saying that there is evil in the world, we use the expression which I have used, quote, what we call evil, end quote, we have partly anticipated the emperor's answer. We see and feel and know imperfectly very few things in the few years that we live. 
and all the knowledge and all the experience of all the human race is positive ignorance of the whole which is infinite. Now, as our reason teaches us that everything is in some way related to and connected with every other thing, all notion of evil as being in the universe of things is a contradiction. For if the whole comes from and is governed by an intelligent being, it is impossible to conceive anything in it which tends to the evil or destruction of the whole. Everything is in constant mutation, and yet the whole subsists. We might imagine the solar system resolved into its elemental parts, and yet the whole would still subsist, quote, ever young and perfect, end quote. All things, all forms, are dissolved and new forms appear. All living things undergo the change which we call death. If we call death an evil, then all change is an evil. Living beings also suffer pain, and man suffers most of all, for he suffers both in and by his body, and by his intelligent part. Men suffer also from one another, and perhaps the largest part of human suffering comes to man from those whom he calls his brothers. Antoninus says, quote, Generally, wickedness does no harm at all to the universe, and particularly the wickedness of one man does no harm to another. It is only harmful to him who has it in his power to be released from it as soon as he shall choose, end quote. The first part of this is perfectly consistent with the doctrine that the whole can sustain no evil or harm. The second part must be explained by the Stoic principle that there is no evil in anything which is not in our power. What wrong we suffer from another is his evil, not ours. But this is an admission that there is evil in a sort. For he who does wrong does evil, and if others can endure the wrong, still there is evil in the wrongdoer. Antoninus gives many excellent precepts with respect to wrongs and injuries, and his precepts are practical. He teaches us to bear what we cannot avoid, and his lessons may be just as useful to him who denies the being and the government as God, as to him who believes in both. There is no direct answer in Antoninus to the objections which may be made to the existence and providence of God because of the moral disorder and suffering which are in the world, except this answer which he makes in reply to the supposition that even the best men may be extinguished by death. He says, if it is so, we may be sure that if it ought to have been otherwise, the gods would have ordered it otherwise. His conviction of the wisdom which we may observe in the government of the world is too strong to be disturbed by any apparent irregularities in the order of things. That these disorders exist is a fact, and those who would conclude from them against the being and government of God conclude too hastily. We all admit that there is an order in the material world, a nature, in the sense in which the world has been explained, a constitution, what we call a system, a relation of parts to one another, and a fitness of the whole for something. So in the constitution of plants and animals there is an order, a fitness for some end. Sometimes the order, as we conceive it, is interrupted, and the end, as we conceive it, is not attained. The seed, the plant, or the animal sometimes perishes before it has passed through all its changes and done all its uses. It is according to nature that is a fixed order for some to perish early and for others to do all their uses and leave successors to take their place. So man has a corporeal and intellectual and moral constitution fit for certain uses, and on the whole, man performs these uses, dies, and leaves other men in his place. So society exists, and his social state is manifestly the natural state of man, the state for which his nature fits him, and society amidst innumerable irregularities and disorders still subsists. And perhaps we may say that the history of the past and our present knowledge give us a reasonable hope that its disorders will diminish and that order, its governing principle, may be more firmly established. As order, then, a fixed order, we may say, subject to deviations real or apparent, must be admitted to exist in the whole of nature of things. That which we call disorder, or evil, as it seems to us, does not in any way alter the fact of the general constitution of things having a nature or fixed order. Nobody will conclude from the existence of disorder that order is not the rule. For the existence of order, both physical and moral, is proved by daily experience and all past experience. We cannot conceive how the order of the universe is maintained. We cannot even conceive how our own life from day to day is continued, nor how we perform the simplest movements of the body, nor how we grow and think and act, though we know many of the conditions which are necessary for all these functions. Knowing nothing, then, the unseen power which acts in ourselves except by what is done, we know nothing of the power which acts through what we call all time and all space. But seeing that there is a nature or fixed order in all things known to us, it is conformable to the nature of our minds to believe that this universal nature has a cause which operates continually, and that we are totally unable to speculate on the reason of any of those disorders or evils which we perceive. 
This, I believe, is the answer which may be collected from all that Antoninus has said. The origin of evil is an old question. Achilles tells Priam that Zeus has two casks, one filled with good things and the other with bad, and that he gives to men out of each according to his pleasure, and so we must be content, for we cannot alter the will of Zeus. One of the Greek commentators asked how we must reconcile this doctrine with what we find in the first book of the Odyssey, where the king of the gods says, Men say evil comes to them from us, but they bring it on themselves through their own folly. The answer is plain enough, even to the Greek commentator. The poets make both Achilles and Zeus speak appropriately to their several characters. Indeed, Zeus says plainly that men do attribute their sufferings to the gods, but they do it falsely, for they are the cause of their own sorrows. Epictetus, in his Enchiridion, makes short work of the question of evil. He says, quote, As a mark is not set up for the purpose of missing it, so neither does the nature of evil exist in the universe. End quote. This will appear obscure enough to those who are not acquainted with Epictetus, but he always knows what he is talking about. We do not set up a mark in order to miss it, though we may miss it. God, whose existence Epictetus assumes, has not ordered all things so that his purpose shall fail. Whatever there may be of what we call evil, the nature of evil as he expresses it does not exist. That is, evil is not part of the constitution or nature of things. If there were a principle of evil in the constitution of things, evil would no longer be evil, as Simplicius argues, but evil would be good. Simplicius has a long and curious discourse on this text of Epictetus, and it is amusing and instructive. One passage more will conclude this matter. It contains all that the emperor could say, quote, To go from among men, if there are gods, is not a thing to be afraid of, for the gods will not involve thee in evil. But if indeed they do not exist, or if they have no concern about human affairs, what is it to me to live in a universe devoid of gods or devoid of providence? But in truth they do exist, and they do care for human things, and they have put all the mean in man's power to enable him not to fall into real evils. And as to the rest, if there was anything evil, they would have provided for this also, that it should be altogether in a man's power not to fall into it. But that which does not make a man worse, how can it make a man's life worse? But neither through ignorance, nor having the knowledge, but not the power to guard against or correct these things, is it possible that the nature of the universe has overlooked them? Nor is it possible that it has made so great a mistake, either through want of power or want of skill, that good and even shall happen indiscriminately to the good and the bad. But death certainly, and life, honor, and dishonor, pain and pleasure, all these things equally happen to good and bad men, being things which make us neither better nor worse. Therefore, they are neither good nor evil. End quote. The ethical part of Antoninus's philosophy follows from his general principles. The end of all his philosophy is to live conformably to nature, both a man's own nature and the nature of the universe. Bishop Butler has explained what the Greek philosophers meant when they spoke of living according to nature, and he says that when it is explained, as he has explained it, and as they understood it, it is, quote, a manner of speaking not loose and undeterminate, but clear and distinct, strictly just and true, end quote. To live according to nature is to live according to a man's whole nature, not according to a part of it, and to reverence the divinity within him as the governor of all his actions, quote, to the rational animal, the same act is according to nature and according to reason. End quote. That which is done contrary to reason is also an act contrary to nature, to the whole nature, though it is certainly conformable to some part of man's nature, or it could not be done. Man is made for action, not for idleness or pleasure. As plants and animals do the uses of their nature, so man must do his. Man must also live conformably to the universal nature, conformable to the nature of all things of which he is one, and, as a citizen of a political community, he must direct his life and actions with reference to those among whom, and for whom, among other purposes, he lives. A man must not retire into solitude and cut himself off from his fellow men. He must be ever active to do his part in the great whole. All men are his kin, not only in blood but still more by participating in the same intelligence and by being a portion of the same divinity. A man cannot really be injured by his brethren, for no act of theirs can make him bad, and he must not be angry with them nor hate them. Quote, for we are made for cooperation, like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the rows of the upper and lower teeth. To act against one another, then, is contrary to nature, and it is acting against one another to be vexed and to turn away. End quote. 
Further, he says, quote, Take pleasure in one thing and rest in it, in passing from one social act to another social act, thinking of God. End quote. Again, quote, Love mankind, follow God. End quote. It is the characteristic of the rational soul for man to love his neighbor. Antoninus teaches in various passages the forgiveness of injuries, and we know that he also practiced what he taught. Bishop Butler remarks that, quote, this divine precept to forgive injuries and to love our enemies, though to be met with genteel moralists, yet is in a peculiar sense a precept of Christianity, as our Savior has insisted more upon it than on any other single virtue, end quote. The practice of this precept is the most difficult of all virtues. Antoninus often enforces it and gives us aid towards following it. When we are injured, we feel anger and resentment, and the feeling is natural, just, and useful for the conservation of society. It is useful that wrongdoers should feel the natural consequences of their actions, among which is the disapprobation of society and the resentment of him who is wronged. But revenge, in the proper sense of that word, must not be practiced. Quote, the best way of avenging thyself, end quote, says the emperor, quote, is not to become like the wrongdoer, end quote. It is plain by this that he does not mean that we should in any case practice revenge, but he says to those who talk of revenging wrongs, be not like him who has done the wrong. Socrates in the Credo says the same in other words. In St. Paul, quote, when a man has done thee any wrong, immediately consider with what opinion about good or evil he has done wrong. For when thou hast seen this, thou wilt pity him, and wilt neither wonder nor be angry, end quote. Antoninus would not deny that wrong naturally produces the feeling of anger and resentment, for this is implied in the recommendation to reflect on the nature of the man's mind who has done the wrong, and then you will have pity instead of resentment. And so it comes to the same as St. Paul's advice to be angry and sin not, which, as Butler well explains it, is not a recommendation to be angry, which nobody needs, for anger is a natural passion. But it is a warning against allowing anger to lead us into sin. In short, the emperor's doctrine about wrongful acts is this. Wrongdoers do not know what good and bad are. They offend out of ignorance. And in the sense of the Stoics, this is true. Though this kind of ignorance will never be admitted as a legal excuse, and ought not to be admitted as a full excuse in any way by society, there may be grievous injuries, such as it is in a man's power to forgive without harm to society. And if he forgives because he sees that his enemies know not what they do, he is acting in the spirit of the sublime prayer, quote, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, end quote. The emperor's moral philosophy was not a feeble, narrow system which teaches man to look directly to his own happiness, though a man's happiness or tranquility is indirectly promoted by living as he ought to do. A man must live conformably to the universal nature, which means, as the emperor explains it in many passages, that a man's action must be conformable to his true relations to all other human beings, both as a citizen of a political community and as a member of the whole human family. This implies, and he often expresses it in the most forcible language, that a man's words and actions, so far as they affect others, must be measured by a fixed rule, which is their consistency with the conservation and the interests of the particular society of which he is a member, and of the whole human race. To live conformably to such a rule, a man must use his rational faculties in order to discern clearly the consequences and full effect of all his actions, and of the actions of others. He must not live a life of contemplation and reflection only, though he must often retire within himself to calm and purify his soul by thought, but he must mingle in the work of man and be a fellow laborer for the general good. A man should have an object or purpose in life, that he may direct all his energies to it, of course a good object. He who has not one object or purpose of life cannot be one and the same all through his life. Bacon has a remark to the same effect, on the best means of, quote, reducing of the mind unto virtue and good estate, which is the electing and propounding unto a man's self-good and virtuous ends of his life, such as may be in a reasonable sort within his compass to attain. End quote. He is a happy man who has been wise enough to do this when he was young and has had the opportunities. But the emperor, seeing well that a man cannot always be so wise in his youth, encourages him to do it when he can, and not to let his life slip away before he has begun. He who can propose to himself good and virtuous ends of life and be true to them cannot fail to live conformably to his own interest and universal interest, for in the nature of things they are one. If a thing is not good for the hive, it is not good for the bee. One passage may end this matter. Quote, 
If the gods have determined about me and about the things which must happen to me, they have determined well, for it is not easy even to imagine a deity without forethought. And as to doing me harm, why should they have any desire towards that? For what advantage would result to them for this or to the whole, which is the special object of their providence? But if they have not determined about me individually, they have certainly determined about the whole at least, and the things which happen by way of sequence in this general arrangement I ought to accept with pleasure and to be content with them. But if they determine about nothing, which it is wicked to believe, or if we do believe it, let us neither sacrifice, nor pray, nor swear by them, nor do anything else which we do as if the gods were present and lived with us. But if, however, the gods determine about none of these things which concern us, I am able to determine about myself, and I can inquire about that which is useful, and that is useful to every man which is conformable to his own constitution and nature. But my nature is rational and social, and my city and country, so far as I am Antoninus, is Rome. But so far as I am a man, it is the world. The things, then, which are useful to these cities are alone useful to me. It would be tedious, and it is not necessary, to state that the emperor's opinions on all the ways in which a man may profitably use his understanding towards perfecting himself in practical virtue. The passages to this purpose are in all parts of his book, but as they are in no order or connection, a man must use the book a long time before he will find out all that is in it. A few words may be added here. If we analyze all other things, we find how insufficient they are for human life, and how truly worthless many of them are. Virtue alone is indivisible, one and perfectly satisfying. The notion of virtue cannot be considered vague or unsettled because a man may find it difficult to explain the notion fully to himself or to expound it to others in such a way as to prevent cavilling. Virtue as a whole, and no more consists of parts than man's intelligence does, and yet we speak of various intellectual faculties as a convenient way of expressing the various powers which man's intellect shows by his works. In the same way, we may speak of various virtues or parts of virtue in a practical sense for the purpose of showing what particular virtues we ought to practice in order to exercise of the whole of virtue, that is, as much as man's nature is capable of. The prime principle in man's constitution is social. The next in orders is not to yield to the persuasions of the body when they are not conformable to the rational principle, which must govern. The third is freedom from error and from deception. Quote, Let then the ruling principle holding fast to these things go straight on, and it has what is its own. End quote. The emperor selects justice as the virtue which is the basis of all the rest and this had been said long before his time. It is true that all people have some notion of what is meant by justice as a disposition of the mind, and some notion about acting in conformity to this disposition. But experience shows that men's notions about justice are as confused as their actions are inconsistent with the true notion of justice. The emperor's notion of justice is clear enough, but not practical enough for all mankind. Quote, let there be freedom from perturbations with respect to the things which come from the external cause, and let there be justice in the things done by virtue of the internal cause. That is, let there be a movement and action terminating in this, in social acts, for this is according to thy nature. End quote. In another place, he says that, quote, He who acts unjustly acts impiously, end quote. which follows, of course, from all that he says in various places. He insists on the practice of truth as a virtue and as a means to virtue, which it no doubt is, for lying even in indifferent things weakens the understanding, and lying maliciously is as great a moral offense as man can be guilty of, viewed both as showing an habitual disposition and viewed with respect to consequences. He couples the notion of justice with action. A man must not pride himself on having some fine notion of justice in his head, but he must exhibit his justice in act, like St. James' notion of faith, but this is enough. The Stoics, and Antoninus among them, call some things beautiful and some ugly. And as they are beautiful, so they are good. And as they are ugly, so they are evil or bad. All these things, good and evil, are in our power absolutely. Some of the stricter Stoics would say, in a manner only, as those who would not depart altogether from common sense would say, practically they are to a great degree in the power of some persons and in some circumstances, but in a small degree only in other persons and in other circumstances. The Stoics maintain man's free will as to the things which are in his power, for as to the things which are out of his power, free will terminating in action is, of course, excluded by the very terms of the expression. I hardly know if we can discover exactly Antoninus' notion of the free will of man, 
nor is the question worth the inquiry. What he does mean and does say is intelligible. All the things which are not in our power are indifferent. They are neither good nor bad morally. Such are life, health, wealth, power, disease, poverty, and death. Life and death are all men's portion. Health, wealth, power, disease, and poverty happen to men indifferently, to the good and to the bad, to those who live according to nature and to those who do not. Quote, life, says the emperor, is a warfare and a stranger's sojourn, and after fame is oblivion. End quote. After speaking of those men who have disturbed the world and then died, and of the death of philosophers such as Heraclitus and Democritus, who was destroyed by Lice, and of Socrates, whom other Lice, his enemies, destroyed, he says, quote, What means all this? Thou hast embarked, thou hast made the voyage, thou art come to shore, get out. If indeed to another life there is no want of gods, not even there. But if to a state without sensation, thou wilt cease to be held by pains and pleasures, and to be a slave to the vessel which is as much inferior to that which serves it as superior, for the one is intelligence and deity, the other is earth and corruption. End quote. It is not death that man should fear, but he should fear never beginning to live according to his nature. Every man should live in such a way as to discharge his duty, and to trouble himself about nothing else. He should live such a life that he shall always be ready for death and shall depart content when the summon comes. For what is death? Quote, a cessation of the impressions through the senses, and of the pulling of the strings which move the appetites, and of the discursive movements of the thoughts, and of the service to the flesh. End quote. Death is such as generation is, a mystery of nature. In another passage, the exact meaning of which is perhaps doubtful, he speaks of the child which leaves the womb, and so he says the soul at death leaves its envelope. As the child is born or comes into life by leaving the womb, so the soul may, on leaving the body, pass into another existence which is perfect. I am not sure if this is the emperor's meaning. Antoninus' opinion of a future life is nowhere clearly expressed. His doctrine of the nature of the soul of necessity implies that it does not perish absolutely, for a portion of divinity cannot perish. The opinion is at least as old as the time of Epicharmus and Euripides. What comes from the earth goes back to the earth and what comes from heaven, the divinity, returns to him who gave it. But I find nothing clear in Antoninus as to the notion of the man existing after death, so as to be conscious of his sameness with the soul which occupied his vessel of clay. He seemed to be perplexed on this matter, and finally to have rested in this, that God or the gods will do whatever is best and consistent with the university of things. Nor, I think, does he speak conclusively on another Stoic doctrine, which some Stoics practice, the anticipating the regular course of nature by man's own act. The reader will find some passages in which this is touched on, and he may make of them what he can. But there are passages in which the emperor encourages himself to wait for the end patiently and with tranquility. And certainly it is consistent with all his best teaching that a man should bear all that falls to his lot and do useful acts as long as he lives. He should not, therefore, abridge the time of his usefulness by his own act. Whether he contemplates any possible cases in which a man should die by his own hand, I cannot tell, and the matter is not worth the curious inquiry, for I believe it would not lead to any certain result as to his opinion on this point. I do not think that Antoninus, who never mentioned Seneca, though he must have known all about him, would have agreed with Seneca when he gives as a reason for suicide that the eternal law, whatever he means, has made nothing better for us than this, that it has given us only one way of entering life and many ways of going out of it. The ways of going out indeed are many, and that is a good reason for a man taking care of himself. Happiness was not the direct object of a Stoic's life. There is no rule of life contained in the precept that a man should pursue his own happiness. Many men think that they are seeking happiness when they are only seeking the gratification of some particular passion, the strongest that they have. The end of a man is, as already explained, to live conformably to nature, and he will thus obtain happiness, tranquility of mind, and contentment. As a means of living conformably to nature, he must study the four chief virtues, each of which has its proper sphere, wisdom, or the knowledge of good and evil, justice, or the giving to every man his due, fortitude, or the enduring of labor and pain, and temperance, which is moderation in all things. 
By thus loving conformity to nature, the Stoic obtained all that he wished or expected. His reward was in his virtuous life, and he was satisfied with that. Some Greek poet long ago wrote, quote, For virtue only of all human things takes reward not from the hands of others. Virtue herself rewards the toils of virtue. End quote. Some of the Stoics indeed express themselves in very arrogant, absurd terms about the wise man's self-sufficiency. They elevated him to the rank of a deity. But these were only talkers and lecturers, such as those in all ages who utter fine words, knowing little of human affairs and caring only for notoriety. Epictetus and Antoninus, both by precept and example, labor to improve themselves and others. And if we discover imperfections in their teaching, we must still honor these great men who attempted to show that there is in a man's nature and in the constitution of things sufficient reason for living a virtuous life. It is difficult enough to live as we ought to live, difficult even for any man to live in such a way as to satisfy himself if he exercises only in a moderate degree the power of reflecting upon and reviewing his own conduct. And if all men cannot be brought to the same opinions and morals in religion, it is at least worth while to give them good reasons for as much as they can be persuaded to accept. End. Meditations of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, Section 14. The Philosophy of Antoninus by George Long. End of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius.